Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Dear ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and speakers. On behalf of the organizing committee members from the Breast Cancer Resource Center, Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University Malaya Cancer Research Institute, UMCRI, Medical Genetics Unit, University of Malaya, and our partners together against cancer, TAC, Cancer Research Malaysia, CRM, Breast Surgery International, BSI, College of Surgeon Academy of Medicine, CSAMM, Genetic Counseling Society Malaysia, the Family Medicine Association Malaysia, FSM, FMSA, Malaysian Nursing Association. I would like to welcome, uh, to, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the webinar for clinicians today. We really appreciate you taking off, especially on Sunday, to join our webinar today. I'm Dr. Suniza, consultant breast and ochoplastic surgeon, University of Malaya will be moderating our webinar today. Today webinar is about BRCA genetic testing and risk management as the virtual seminar considers as the new norm for us during COVID-19 outbreak. We hope that you will find our program lineup most engaging and insightful. And most importantly, you will be credited three CPD points at the end of this webinar. This half-day webinar for clinicians aim to provide Malaysian healthcare professionals with localized information on genetic testing and cancer risk management. This webinar will give a deeper understanding of genetic testing for the management of individuals at risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. As we can see from the agenda for today, this webinar offers six different interesting topics of discussion. We will be having six speakers who are expert in their field to share their knowledge or ideas and enlighten us about the genetic testing. I'm also excited to inform you that Prof Owen Ang, who is our external speaker from Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital, will be joining us for our webinar today. We will be compiling questions or queries about our topics today to be answered after each lecture. Again, I repeat, please type the question in the Q&A box at the right bottom corner of your screen. Please do note this is different from the chat box. Without further ado, it gives us great pleasure to invite our first speaker for today, Associate Prof. Dr. Maniza, who's an expert in managing cancer patients to deliver the first topic of the lecture on agnostic genetic testing for precision medicine in oncology. Associate Prof. Dr. Maniza is a consultant clinical oncologist department of oncology, University Malaya Medical Center. Please welcome Prof. Maniza. Thank you very much, uh, Suniza, for your introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to deliver this uh, very first talk today, and uh, I take it as a warming up session um, to prepare you all uh, for the main hardcore stuff, you know, by the experts in genetics and cancer uh, later on. So very good Sunday morning to everyone, uh, my fellow uh, speakers, the organizing committee, the IT crews, and especially to our colleagues and friends out there in the audience. We have many people from all parts of Malaysia, including uh, Sabah. So at this very difficult time, I think our hearts goes out to everyone out there, especially our frontliners and people in Sabah. May the force be with us and we can get through this challenging time. So I'm gonna talk about precision medicine and oncology uh, and genetic testing. So before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge that several slides and materials that are used in these slides were adapted and adapted from various sources and people, including Prof. Aisha and also the World Wide Web. So the content, let's look at a bit on precision medicine and then look at the biology uh, on DNA repair, how it works or how it fails to work uh, in cancer, uh, focusing on BRCA, PARP and PARP inhibitor. And then we look at some clinical evidence, how we target these DNA repair defects, mainly by using PARP inhibitors in patients with uh, DNA repair defects and HRR 
refers to homologously combination repair pathway. And finally, look at uh, on genetic testing, germline versus somatic, and which tests we should be doing. So precision medicine. If we look at the landscape of treatment at the moment, you know, one treatment fits all, even though we wish it is the past, but currently is still in the current uh, therapy that we use. So what it means really, we treat patients based on the type of cancer. For example, if we have a group of patients with colon cancer, we assume that the cancer behaves in the same manner and all patients get the same treatment. But of course we know there is a flaw to this uh, approach because the tumors are actually heterogeneous. So the same colon cancer in different patients, or in fact, in the same patient may not behave in the same way because they're very heterogeneous. Therefore, we do see some effects in some patients, but it's not gonna be a surprise that many patients may not derive any benefit. And some of them may even get detrimental uh, effects because of side effects with no um, benefit at all. So what we like to move towards, in fact, we have moved towards it, but we like it to be the trend in the future is what we call personalized treatment, where we treat patients based on certain predictive biomarkers that defines how the cancer behaves. So in order to deliver this treatment, we need to be able to identify the main pathways uh, that controls how the cancer grow and survive and identify specific molecules in the pathway that can be targeted with certain drug therapy. And by doing so, we hope that we will only deliver the treatment to those patients who have the markers and they're more likely to benefit from the treatment. This is the essence of precision medicine. And essentially what it means really, if we have uh, predictive biomarkers that that will work when um, that will define you know how the cancer should be treated. So essentially, we might treat patients. You know, depend doesn't matter what types of cancer they have, but it's based on whether they have the markers. So essentially, many different tumor types with the same predictive biomarkers may be treated with the same treatment. This is what we call tumor agnostic approach. So. Currently, we already have several genetic mutations that are already being used in clinical practice. So based on various genetic testings. So this is just a list to share with you some of the ones that we are already using in clinical practice. So the various mutations and the targeted therapy that's available. So for example, KRAS mutation in colon cancer. So that will predict benefit using EGFR targeted therapy, cetuximab, benitumumab. And for breast cancer, HER2 gene amplification predicts benefit using HER2 targeting agent like trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Now, PIK3CA is more recent using a drug called alpalisid, which is not yet, I think just been approved, but not yet launched in Malaysia. So relatively more recently, when we look at mutations in DNA repair pathways, so you look at number six and seven, that's mismatch, mismatch repair defect, and also BRCA mutation. Of course, our focus today is on BRCA mutation and the use of PARP inhibitor like Olaparib Nirapucaparib and talazoparib in breast, ovarian and prostate cancer. So mainly focusing on the BRCA gene or breast cancer gene. So genomic instability and mutation, including in the DNA repair pathway was already elucidated in the hallmark of cancer as early as 2013. And then PARP inhibitor as a potential uh, therapeutic strategy uh, against uh, this uh, hallmark of cancer, how it grow and survive. So now let's look at a bit on the biology because in order to understand how this drug works, right? So we need to understand uh, a bit on DNA repair, how it works normally and how it feels to work in cancer. So this is a bit complex, but I will walk through this with you. Right, so this is a diagram to describe the DNA repair uh, mechanism, right? So constantly we're gonna see a lot of DNA damage, right? Due to various uh, reasons, but the main ones would be just random replication errors. And there's many different types of DNA uh, damage, but the main ones that I want to focus is SSB and DSB. So single strand break and double strand break. And, and more thousands of events occur on a daily basis. And between the two double strand breaks is potentially the most lethal because it results in, in loss of a lot of genetic uh, information. And if this does not get repaired, potentially the cell can die because it cannot proceed through the cell cycle. So what happens when we see this, when the cells see these damages, 
uh, or DNA uh, damages, then at certain checkpoints, so it will stop the progression of the cancer through the cell cycle to allow DNA repair to occur. And three uh, outcomes would be what is shown here. One is perfect, which is what we want. So the damages are repaired uh, and back to normal and the cell can proceed through the cell cycle. Second is imperfect repair, but still um, the cell is still able to survive and proceed through the cell cycle. But as you can see here, it creates some mutations uh, in the DNA. And with multiple uh, damages later on, you know, with accumulation of mutations, this may result in uh, carcinogenesis. So uh, the third outcome is a failed repair, where completely the, the cell were unable, is unable to repair the damages and the cell cannot survive and this will result in cell death. So let's look at the various pathways, how uh, DNA damages are repaired. Again, quite complex, but it's, it's easy when we know how to look at this. So if you look at uh, the diagram, it starts with the various type of DNA damages up here, but the main one that we're going to focus is the single strand break and double strand break. Right? And then the various DNA repair mechanisms for the different types of DNA damage. And you can see here all the proteins and the genes that are involved in all these various DNA damage repair and the types of tumor in which these were affected and the drug therapy uh, that can be used uh, to target uh, these um, pathways. So again, we're going to focus on mainly DSP repair. Okay, but we also look at the single strand rate repair because that's where the PARP protein is involved. So essentially PARP is involved in the repair of single strand rates, while BRCA genes and a few other genes here are involved in repair of double strand rate, mainly via the HRR uh, pathway uh, that refers to homologous recombination repair. So let's look at these two main repair pathway for double strand break. Right, one is non-homologous end joining repair, and the other one is homologous recombination repair. And as, as I've mentioned before, HRR is the main repair pathway, mainly because it is it repairs the, the damaged um, uh, DNA and 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 create um, the original uh, match to it. So it's a flawless repair. So what happens right when we get to when the cell detect uh, double strand break? So BRCA proteins will then get recruited and they will also recruit other DNA repair proteins to the site and they will find the sister chromatid and find a match to that area where, where there has been a break and use that to, as a template to repair. So as you can imagine, this will produce exactly the same uh, DNA as if the DNA damage has not occurred. So this is what we really want. Whereas non-homologous end joining, it is impossible to proceed uh, to survive with this uh, repair, but there's a flaw to this because what happens is that uh, all the proteins will then just chew up the area that has been uh, damaged to trim it nicely and then glue them together. So this repair, even though it may uh, make the cell survive, but it introduced uh, deletions, potentially can also be uh, disastrous. Right, so let's look at now single strand break. When you have a single strand break, then one of the proteins, major proteins that's involved is PARP that refers to poly ADP ribose polymerase. They are a group of enzymes that's involved in DNA repair. And PARP1 is the most abundant and best characterized among the enzymes. And it plays a key role in single strand rate repair via the base excision repair and single screen strand break repair pathways. So what happens when the cell detect a single strand break? So PARP uh, protein will be recruited and it will recruit other proteins as well to the site and they will together repair the damage and then will leave the site for the cell to then proceed through the cell cycle. So PARP inhibitor is uh, a group of drugs Right? So you can see here, these are the four main ones uh, as they have been approved for many different tumor sites. So what's the involvement of PARP inhibitor? Basically, it inhibits DNA repair. So PARP actually binds itself to PARP proteins and therefore preventing uh, uh, the single strand break. So if you put all the three together in order to understand how they work, you know, we have to look at them you know, together. So this is the story of PARP, PARP inhibitor, and also BRCA, all right? Right, so imagine if you have a single strand break and then we get part protein being recruited, so it binds that site and also recruit other crew members to uh, repair the DNA damage and together they repair that site and then leave 
you know, the, uh, the DNA for it to go through cell cycle. So what happens when we introduce PARP inhibitor? So for example here, right, if we, if we, if PARP inhibitor comes in, so it will go and find the PARP protein and binds to it, right? So what happens, this complex cannot dissociate and it will just get fixed at that DNA portion and will form a larger and larger complex after a while. And eventually, you know, the replication fault will open up and eventually will result in double strand break. So it doesn't repair the single strand break and make it worse, and then it will create double strand break. So when there's a normal BRCA gene uh, in that cancer, right? Because remember, BRCA is one of the most important proteins to repair double strand breaks via the HRR pathway. So this is not going to be a major problem because then that double strand break can be repaired. Therefore, the cell will survive. So if this occur in a cell that has BRCA mutation, right? So the BRCA protein are not functioning well. So then they are unable to repair these double strand breaks and eventually cell will die. Okay, so that's how it works. So this actually describes the phenomenon of synthetic lethality, right? Where you have PARP inhibitor in the event, in, in, in the background of a cell having BRCA mutation that will result in cell death. If you look at it here, it cannot work alone. So if you have a single strand break and you deliver PARP inhibitor, but there's no, I mean, the BRCA gene is still active. So that can be repaired and the cell will survive. There's the same thing in a tumor cell that is not BRCA deficient, right? They can also repair the double strand break so the cell will survive. But if you have a BRCA deficient tumor cell and you deliver PARP inhibitor, you create more double strand breaks, but you do not have a fully functioning BRCA genes to actually repair that. And this is what we call synthetic lethality that results in tumor cell death. So, which is a benefit to us because potentially, you know, this is a way to target uh, the cancer cells. So then let's look at uh, the clinical evidence, right? So PARP inhibitors in cancer, we already have the drugs being approved for many different cancer types, but mainly those who, which we know that's uh, usually BRCA mutation is a part of uh, the growth and survival of these uh, cancer types, for example, breast cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, and also pancreatic cancer. So this table summarizes the main uh, PARP inhibitor that's, that's being, that, that are being used in clinical practice and also in clinical studies. So they are given orally and just focus on this column here on, on the studies. Uh, so you can see the various uh, tumor sites like breast, uh, ovarian and prostate cancer and the various studies that have shown benefit and many ongoing ones. So in terms of FDA approval, the PARP inhibitors have been approved for breast, ovarian, prostate and also pancreatic cancer. Right, I promised uh, Aisha that I'm not going to show too many uh, kaplan meyer survival curves, but I think I have to show some to show you that uh, the evidence that this uh, PARP inhibitor uh, works. So this is a study of Olaparib in uh, breast cancer with germline BRCA mutation. So this include patients who have failed a few different lines of treatment, which include hormonal therapy and also chemotherapy. And then we randomized they were randomized between olaparib and also standard treatment of choice, you know, type, several types of chemotherapy. And it showed here, you can see the top curve, there's clear separation of the progression-free survival uh, in favor of olaparib. There's a trend towards overall survival benefit, but not statistically significant at present. And this, the second one is talazoparib in patients with advanced breast cancer and germline BRCA mutation, very similar design patients who had failed uh, standard treatment and they were randomized between talazoparib and also physician choice or chemotherapy. And if you can see here, the kaplan meyer survival curve for progression-free survival is very similar to what we saw just now. There's a clear separation in favor of talazoparib and there's a trend towards overall survival benefit. So now let's look at a prostate cancer, right? So olaparib, so this study uh, looked at patients who have failed uh, chemotherapy and also at least one line of a uh, novel hormonal agent, abiraterone or enzalutamide, and it recruited patients with 
uh, BRCA mutation and also, so the difference with the other two studies and also other genes that are involved in uh, HRR pathway. So you can see here that they were divided into two cohorts, cohort A, mainly BRCA mutation and ATM gene mutation, and cohort B to include all the rest. And patients were randomized between Olaparib and physician choice of either abiraterone or ensalutamide. And you can see up here, in terms of the progression-free survival, there's a clear separation in favor of olaparib, and there's also improvement in overall survival in cohort A and also the whole uh, group of patients. But let's look at different um, genes, you know, individually. So this, this study also reported uh, the survival benefit in BRCA mutation, ATM, and CDK. So what's interesting, if you look at here, you just look at the separation in BRCA gene, there's a very clear separation, but you can see for ATM and CDK, they're really more or less overlapping. So there don't seem to be uh, benefit uh, seen in the patients with non-BRCA mutation. And if you look at the, the forest plot here, so if you look at this forest plot, why, uh, this line means that both treatments are the same, but anything towards the left says Ola, means Olaparib is better, anything towards the right could, uh, uh, control is better. And if you look at the gene alteration, right, clear benefit in terms of those with BRCA2 mutation because BRCA2 mutation is more common in prostate cancer compared to BRCA1 in uh, breast cancer. So uh, trend towards benefit in BRCA1 and look at the rest of the genes, right? So they don't seem to be a benefit or maybe a trend towards it, but not clear benefit. But of course, we have to look at this with some cautions because if you look at the number of patients in this uh, each uh, gene mutation, they're much smaller. You can see it's like eight, five, seven, five. So a very small numbers compared to the number of patients with BRCA uh, gene mutation and even CDK12 is quite a reasonable number. So I think we, we really not no, we don't really know yet whether what, what this means, whether truly non-BRCA uh, genes uh, wouldn't benefit or whether we haven't got enough uh, you know, number of patients in these studies. So this is a very busy uh, slide showing the indications of Olaparib, but don't worry about the details. I just want you to look at the highlighted in the ones highlighted in red, okay? so. Basically, we know Olaparib has been approved for ovarian, breast, pancreatic, and prostate cancers, right? So look at the uh, genetic uh, mutation. So in ovarian, germline, or somatic, BRCA mutation, you can see there, mainly BRCA. And you can look at breast cancer, it's mainly germline BRCA mutation, and the same thing with pancreatic. In prostate, it includes both germline and also somatic, but not only in BRCA mutation, but also in other HRR gene mutations. So that brings us to the genetic testing. So how do we identify these patients who would potentially benefit from this treatment? So just a bit on when we talk about germline versus somatic. So this is, uh, so what, what are they? And we know that HRR pathways can be deficient in either germline alone or both germline and somatic. Uh, or somatic alone. So if you look at this typical autosomal dominant inheritance where we have one parent carrying one abnormal gene, right, one allele. So it will result in half of the children being normal and half of the children being carrier. So normal children can develop or can uh, attain this uh, mutation during their lifetime. And when this occurs, this is what we call somatic mutation. So the, the, the children with abnormal allele, so the carrier for the, for the gene in one allele, you know, can stay you know, like that throughout life, or they can also develop mutation, so meaning they can have combined germline and somatic mutations. So what's important about germline versus somatic is that we you know germline is passed on because it, it, it starts in the germ cells and it can, pass, can be passed on from one uh, person to uh, uh, to the, I mean, from uh, parents to the children, and it also means that all cells in the body will contain the mutations. Whereas somatic mutations, it occurs throughout during lifetime, and it occurs in certain type of cells, and it will only pass on to the progeny of the cells rather than to the whole cells. Therefore, you only get the clones in certain parts of the body, and we talk about tumor is mainly going to be in the tumor. Right. So we've talked about genetic testing. 
right? So what are the approaches and aims? So there are three main approaches. One is genomic testing, next is tumor sequencing, and then we have in inherited cancer testing. So genomic testing, when we perform uh, genomic tests on the whole tumor cells, and this is sometimes we use for decision-making on treatment approach, like Oncotype TX uh, for breast cancer and Decipher for prostate cancer. Tumor sequencing when it's, it's looking at the tumor-specific mutations. And this is the one that has the potential benefit for targeted therapies. Uh, and inherited cancer genes, uh, cancer testing is looking at the whole cells performed on blood or saliva and looking at the risk of developing cancer throughout the life. And this is an approach to uh, for cancer screening and prevention. We look at risk management later and also potential benefit for targeted therapy. So we're focusing mainly on these two in this talk, right? So how do we test? Okay, so then we can either do tissue testing that's mainly going to look at somatic mutations or whole blood uh, testing that's going to look at uh, germline and also some somatic mutation if we can identify uh, the circulating tumor DNA or circulating tumor cells in the blood. So current practice, you know, what mostly used is actually blood testing. So mainly we identify in germline testing, but there's some somatic mutations by looking at tumor tissue and from liquid biopsy, looking at CT, uh, circulating tumors, uh, DNA, and also circulating tumor cells. So that's most common and this is less common. So what about the type of uh, genetic mutation? So more commonly, we're looking at BRCA mutation and less commonly, we're looking at all the uh, different HRR mutation gene panels. And as you can see here in ovarian and breast cancer and prostate cancer, BRCA mutation testing is the most commonly performed. And for prostate cancer and potentially other cancers, you know, the HRR mutation testing is not very commonly performed. So, how much of these, if you do germline testing, how much, you know, what's the chances of us finding abnormalities or mutation? But it's going to be very, very low because as we know for breast and ovarian cancer, the risk of the chances of cancer being hereditary is quite low, as low as 5 to 10 percent uh, in breast cancer and about 10 to 20 percent in ovarian cancer. And the same with prostate cancer, only about 12% uh, of men with metastatic prostate cancer has germline DNA repair defects, most commonly BRCA mutation. So most patients do not have uh, these uh, germline mutations. It's, it's, it's not easy to find this. You know, I've, I've done this test on many of my patients and most of the time, you know, they come back as negative such that, you know, you like really become so excited when you see a positive test. So it's, it's really hard to find them. So it's as if trying to find that needle in the haystack. And we hope, we, we, we only wish that there's an easier way to find the, need, the needles, you know, good testing. And maybe we should be looking for more than one type of needles, perhaps. So if you look at uh, here, what type of testing we should be doing, is it going to be just BRCA mutation? germline or is it also going to be looking at the HRR mutation? So the difference is, it is, is an example for prostate cancer, if we just do blood testing, looking at germline mutations, we might find about you know 10 to 15 percent germline BRCA mutation. But if we extend to a uh, uh, somatic BRCA mutation, we might get another 7 percent more. And if we extend it to also include the HRR gene panels, it might go up to up to 25 to 30 percent of patients who might have these mutations. So what does the guideline say? For breast cancer, it's mainly germline mutation. If you want to consider treatment options with a PARP inhibitor. And for prostate cancer, at the moment, it's for germline and somatic mutation. It's not just BRCA, it's the HRR gene. So that's the end of my uh, talk, my take-home messages. BRCA mutation is the most common reason for HRR defect in cancers, and mainly in breast, ovarian, prostate, and to a certain extent in pan pancreatic cancers. And inhibition of PARP by PARP inhibitor in patients with BRCA mutation, that's important because that results in the synthetic lethality that we want to see that results in cancer drug death. So it's very important for us to consider this treatment. We need to, we need to be able to identify the HRR gene defects by genetic testing. And uh, mainly, you know, we know that there's clear evidence of PARP inhibitor in BRCA mutated uh, cancers, but the role in other HRR gene defects is a little bit less, uh, less uh, certain. And the optimal use of PARP inhibitor in BRCA 
or HRI gene defective cancers remains to be confirmed. We know that we can use them in metastatic setting in, in, in later lines, but now we are moving on to earlier lines of treatment in metastatic setting and maybe earlier disease phase and whether you know it will be better when we combine it. So I think there's a lot more to come and we look forward to that. But most importantly, my final comment is that genetic testing is becoming more relevant now than ever. So oncologists like myself will now need to learn and attend uh, webinars like this so that we are also more well aware about genetic testing and cancers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Mariza, for the very enlightening uh, lecture and the explanation on the single and double-stranded DNA damage uh, and repair. It seems like quite complicated, but uh, because with uh, with your explanation looks like uh, a bit easy for me to understand. So now we will have uh, at least um, one minute, I think one to two minutes uh, Q and A session. Uh, please don't forget to type your question in the Q and A box at the right bottom corner of your screen. Uh, do note this is different from the chat box. Okay. Um, Prof. Maniza, I think I, I just give a question uh, about the uh, BRCA mutation. Uh, if someone confirmed with uh, having a BRCA mutation uh, at, at the same time, uh, diagnosed to have a breast cancer, does the oncological treatment differ between BRCA1 and BRCA2? Thank you, Selina. Uh, currently, we do not differentiate between BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, of course, we know BRCA1 mutation is more common. So we don't believe, uh, unless, of course, we have more information in the future. So we, didn't, we don't believe they should be treated in a different way. But of course, how it affects our management also depends on when do we uh, uh, discover this mutation. Because currently, the data, the evidence for targeted therapy for BRCA mutated tumors is mainly in advanced setting, right? But I feel uh, the other message that's important for us um, is also that we might need to think about doing, for oncologists like myself, right, we might need to think about doing this test earlier on, you know, uh, if let's say this has not been done, so maybe at the, at the point of uh, diagnosis of breast cancer, we should be thinking about it, maybe assess the risk and also thinking about doing it rather than waiting and it come to legal lines. Because when that happens, some patients progress quite rapidly and there's not much time, some time, you know, to think about this for counselling and to do the test. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank, thank you, Prof. Suniza, for that um, answer. This is Prof. Kyo. Can I um, add to that? Because I think it's quite important to note that there have been now a number of studies to try and look at whether the second copy of the BRCA gene is lost um, in the tumor samples itself. So there's now new data to suggest that for ovarian cancer, for BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, the second wild type copy is very often lost in the tumor itself, suggesting that loss of that second allele is critical for the cancer to develop. But in breast cancer, the situation appears to be quite different. So loss of heterozygosity in triple negative breast cancer and in the majority of BRCA1 seems to happen quite frequently. But for BRCA2, um, loss of heterozygosity doesn't happen so frequently in breast cancer. So there's some suggestion that there may be a different effect to PARP inhibitors if there's no loss of the second wild time allele. This hasn't yet translated to a change in recommendations for in a clinical setting because the number of patients that have been treated is still relatively small to enable a distinction between BRCA1 carriers and BRCA2 carriers. But I think it's useful to watch this space because there is a lot of emerging data in, in that scenario and we are contributing to that. So hopefully we'll be able to report back on what that means for um, uh, whether BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers should be treated differently. I also wanted to kind of um, comment a little bit on the prostate cancer. I think you gave a really nice overview on the metastatic prostate cancer. It's worth pointing out that BRCA2 tends to develop, tends to um, develop high-grade high grade, high Gleason score uh, prostate cancer, whereas for BRCA1, there's no association, no strong association with high-grade. Do you think that the, the, that may have contributed to a difference in the impact of uh, olaparib in a metastatic setting, the difference between 
BRCA2, where you see high Gleason grade, and BRCA1, where there's not that high Gleason grade in terms of the impact on our treatment. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Sue. Thank you very much for that. And yes, on prostate cancer. I think yes, that's a very interesting uh, point. And but we don't really know quite you know how much you know that will be translated into clinical uh, practice. And also because I think BRCA1 is not very common as well uh, in prostate cancer, as we can see. So I think we need more studies, you know, trying to see whether there are any differences between the two. But currently in clinical practice, we don't tend to treat them. Uh, differently. But yeah, I do take your point, you know, they might have different biology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to Prof Maniza and Prof Su for the comment on the first uh, lecture of uh, for today. So we are going to go for the next uh, topic of lecture. Okay. Uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 uh, are the most well-known genes linked to not only breast cancer risk, uh, but also ovarian cancer risk. Average Malaysian women have 5% risk in developing breast cancer during their lives. By contrast, a recent large study estimated about 72% of women who had a BRCA1 mutation and 69% of women who had a BRCA2 mutation will develop breast cancer at the age of 80. So how about the ovarian cancer risk? So about 1.3% in general population will develop ovarian cancer sometime during their life. Uh, by contrast, it is estimated that 44% of uh, patients with a BRCA1 mutation and about 17% of women with a BRCA2 mutation will develop ovarian cancer by the age of uh, 80. So there's a lot of a question in our mind uh, on how our gynae oncology is handling such a woman. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jamil Omar, who is object obstetrician and gynecologist, gynecological oncologist in National Cancer Institute, Putrajaya. His topic of lecture will be on experience of mainstreaming gynae oncology perspective. Please welcome Dr. Jamil. Thank you, Dr. Suniza, for the kind introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and a very good morning to everyone. Happy Sunday morning. I'm Dr. Jamil from Institute Cancer Negara and I'm a gynae oncologist. First of all, I would like to thank to the organizing committee, University of Malaya, Cancer Research Malaysia, and Prof. Aisha for inviting me to share my experience during the MEDIC study. So I'm going to talk about the burden of uh, ovarian cancer in Malaysia. The BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes has been uh, discussed just now, mainstreaming in ovarian cancer and our experience with the MEDIC study. So in Malaysia, a total of 3,575 cases of ovarian cancer were registered for the period of 2012 to 2016. This is according to the Malaysian National Cancer Registry Report 2012 to 2016. And ovarian cancer is the fourth most common cancer among females in Malaysia. And the age standardized ratio is 5.9 per 100,000 women with the highest incidence at the age of 65 to 69. And the lifetime risk for ovarian cancer in normal population is about 1.6 to 2%. Sorry, Dr. Jamil, uh, yeah. we have a problem to see your uh, screen. There is, um, uh, there is a blocking on the, your uh, screen, actually. You can't really see the whole uh, slides. Can you see better now? Uh, okay, yes. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Okay. So the lifetime risk for ovarian cancer in normal population is about 1.6 to 2%. And out of this, the staging was reported only about 70%. Of this, 56.3% were detected at late stage of 3 and 4. So the incidence of ovarian cancer started to raise after the age of 40 and continues to peak around the age of 65 to 69. And if you look at this graph, about 30% were diagnosed as stage one with good prognosis of 90 to 95 in five year survival. However, about 60 to 70% is detected at stage three and four. And this 
five years survival markedly dropped to 50 to 60% only. And if you look at the age standard ratio, it's about 5.9 per 100,000 women for Malaysian Malay, 5.4 for Chinese and Indian. But surprisingly, if you look at the same cohort in Singapore, they have the highest ASR among the Asian populations with the Malay having 16.3 per 100,000 women, followed by the Chinese 12.8 and the Indian 10.4. I'm not sure why their ASR is markedly higher than us. We are so close, but yet the behavior of cancer among their women are so markedly different. It could be due to their government policy of two children in each family. Maybe because if you look at the theory for ovarian cancer, one of it is incessant ovulation. For those who never get pregnant, they continuously ovulate and cause bleeding and inflammation to the ovarian epithelium. And maybe this is the reason they have more cancer than us. Another thing is that maybe they are small, so the likelihood of missing in data collection is less. So it was discussed uh, in length just now, so I just go very brief. Huh? BRCA1 and BRCA2 are called tumor suppressor genes, and these genes will help prevent cancer by preventing any abnormal and uncontrolled cell growth. BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are involved in cell growth, cell division, and the repair of damage to the DNA. And mutation in the BRCA genes cause DNA damage in cells to go unrepaired, which increases abnormal DNA that produce abnormal proteins that finally will develop into some types of cancer. And BRCA gene mutations are more common in some groups, including Eastern European Jews, known as the Ashkenazi Jews, and people from Iceland, Denmark, and French Canada. So if you are trying to find a spouse from their group, you have to be careful. So BRCA1 gene have about 50 to 85% risk of developing breast cancer by the age of 70. Yeah? So it is about five to eight fold than the normal population and their risk of developing ovarian cancer is about 40 to 60% by the age of 85. So generally, the risk escalates after the age of 40 years. A man with BRCA2 mutation has increased risk of male breast cancer and higher risk for prostate cancer. And in both men and women with BRCA2 changes, the risk for pancreatic cancer and melanoma is also increased. And if you know that this pancreatic and melanoma, they are very aggressive cancer, Majority on treatment, they will last about 12 to 18 months only. Steve Jobs is exceptional because he has a lot of facilities. So this is our playground, the female genital tract. So uh, NASA talk about going out to space, but we are familiar with the retro peritoneal spaces. So I'm going to talk about, about mainstreaming genetic testing for ovarian cancer in IKN. So mainstreaming, meaning that we incorporate cancer predisposition gene testing as part of our routine cancer care during our follow-up clinic. And this is not our common practice. The common practice is we make a referral to the genetic clinician for gene testing. At present, locally in Malaysia, the geneticist is very limited in numbers. Therefore, the appointment will be at a long duration wait. And when seeing a geneticist, they need at least two extra visits from the normal follow-up, first to do counseling, risk assessment, and if they agree, they will get consent for the test with blood or saliva taking. And second visit is for the result disclosure. So mainstreaming will reduce the number of appointments, time wasted on traveling to either hospital to meet with the genetic clinician. Indirectly, it is an advantage for the genetic clinician as they only need to see the positive result so that they can focus to smaller number of patients with positive result and also with the variant of unknown significant. Majority of studies on mainstreaming genetic testing results show it is acceptable and feasible to be done by the clinician. And if you look at this magic study, 690 patients were recruited via the mainstreaming versus 110 were recruited by the genetic physician. So looking at our patient, So all over Malaysia, there were 800 patients recruited from October 2016 until October 2019. 
and we include all non-mucinous epithelial ovarian cancer regardless of age or family history. And we have to give credit to Dr. Sukhi eh, and their team because from this study, we found that 13.9% eh, of women have this pathogenic variant of uh, BRCA mutation, 11.4% with variant of unknown significant, and 75% has negative result for BRCA mutation. Generally, worldwide, about 15% of ovarian cancer is due to BRCA mutation, but only a minority of these are getting the test in most countries. So in our own population, we have about 120 patients took part. Okay? From this graph, you can see by ethnicity, the Malays contribute about 73.3%, Chinese about 13%, and Indian about 12.5%. This model might give a false impression that Malay are more predisposed for ovarian cancer. I presume the graph is like this as Chinese and Indians, they might have other options to get treatment from the private facilities. In terms of age, if you can still remember this graph, the cancer start to raise at the age of 40 until the age of 69. So if you look at this graph, uh, Majority are from the age of 50 to 59, as well as 40 to 49. And these two groups contribute about 70% of the cases. However, if you combine the age of 60 to 69, these two, three groups will contribute up to 85% 80, of the ovarian cancer cases. So you see that age less than 30 only contribute this part, which is about 15%. So tumor histology, among our cohort in IKN, the histology mainly comprised of three main groups, which is high-grade serous carcinoma, contributed almost half of the population at 48%, followed by endometrial adenocarcinoma, 32%, 23%, and clear cell carcinoma, about 21%. Combination of all these three will total into 91.6%. So our own IKN result, in our population, we found that about 17.5% has BRCA mutation, 11.7% has variant of unknown significant, and 71% has no BRCA mutation. In IKN cohort, the BRCA mutation is slightly higher than the actual study result, which is 13.9. So pre-test counseling. This is the part that we incorporate in our daily uh, follow-up clinic. So our experience is usually the average time for counseling is about 30 to 40 minutes for each patient. And it will be assisted by one of these researchers from CRM. They are very dedicated, uh, Ms. Shuhada and also Ms. Hema. Usually we have one pre-test session. However, some patient and relative would like to repeat the session in the ward. Patients were recruited mostly from the clinic during the review of their histopathology report and we communicated in Bahasa Malaysia and sometimes in English. And usually this pre-test counseling will be conducted with the family around. So when we talk about uh, pre-test counseling, we will always refer to this beautiful winning, uh, Hollywood winning actress, uh, Angelina Jolie. So I think you all know about her story. Her mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer at the age of 46. Her mother underwent surgery and chemotherapy. She fought for the disease for a decade, but sadly died at the age of 56. Following her death, Miss Julie was counseled and she agreed to take the BRCA mutation gene testing. And she was found to have mutation of a BRCA1 gene. Her doctor estimated that she has about 87% risk of breast cancer and 50% risk of developing ovarian cancer. So not wanting to suffer like her mother, she bravely decided to go for risk-reducing surgery by doing bilateral mastectomy, followed by breast reconstruction, as well as bilateral saltingo oophorectomy. So the main gist, uh, when, for us as a surgeon, when you talk about BRCA mutation, we are talking about future risk of cancer. So always the question will be, are they willing to go for risk-reducing surgery? So this is the flyers that we use when we counsel patient for BRCA gene testing. And I have to give credit to Dr. Faiz, a gynecologist from, from Seremban for drawing these simplified flyers. 
So we tell them that we are conducting magic studies. Uh, this is sponsored by the Cancer Research Malaysia. And we are giving special offer to test their BRCA gene mutation. And it is free. Okay. Uh, it is not compulsory for them to take part, but we will encourage them to do so. Okay. We will take blood or saliva. And if they agree, we will get the consent. And this is private and confidential, and the result will be ready within six to eight weeks. So we will tell them that the advantage of doing the test is that they might know whether they carry this abnormal BRCA mutation. It will help also to decide whether they have another type of chemotherapy in addition if they have recurrence, and they will know whether they have a risk to develop other cancers. So what are the favorite questions during this uh, pre-test counseling? So number one, the patient will ask what are the benefits for them in doing this test? So as I mentioned, they know whether this cancer is related to a BRCA mutation. And number two, if they have the opportunity, they can use a special drug if they have recurrence. And they are concerned about their daughters and son, whether they have similar problem. And our answer to them is they have to be tested first and if they carry the abnormal gene, then only we will provide free tests for their uh, children. And they are worried also about their siblings. So we tell them similar answer. If they are positive, their sibling will get a free test as well. So the last question is, if the, if the result is positive, can they keep it secret? Obviously can, because as we told you, it is private and confidential. And why they are concerned about this, we will find out later. So what are the challenges during this study? Not many patients would voluntarily enroll into the study and uptake may be around 70 to, 70 to 80% only. Whereas the other 20 to 30% will wait and see. And during this uh, counseling, sometimes it delay our patient flow in the clinic as we need to spend more time convincing about safety and advantage of doing the BRCA BRCA testing. But over time, things get smooth with the help of the two research assistants. So reasons for them not wanting to participate because they are worried about being a carrier as it carries a stigma on the family, especially if they are female, as they are carrying this hereditary disease. And some family members does not agree, especially if their mother is old already. And some worry about increase in premium or rejection by the insurance company. Eh? That is why sometimes they, want, they would like to keep it secret. And some are afraid of needle and worry on blood taking procedure. And some patients think that it does not change the fact that they already have cancer. So experience with result disclosure. So before the result being available, sometime after the blood taking, they become worried. So I will have to thank Hema and Shuhada, the, our assistant, for calling them through the phone and sometimes give a bit of counselling and reassurance for them. Okay. So if the results are negative, it would bring relief and moment of joy, not so much to the patient because they already have cancer, but to her siblings and especially her daughters. It doesn't change their disease, but may give information on treatment option, for example, the chemotherapy, as I mentioned before, and also it provides information if they may require risk-reducing surgery for their breasts, especially if they are young. So far, there is no difficulty in making appointment with the patient, but most of the time, we are the ones who are busy. So in conclusion, mainstreaming is feasible, however, need a dedicated team and assistant, like I mentioned to you just now. Testing will allow more unaffected women, especially family members with BRCA mutation to assess preventive option to prevent this deadly cancer, either breast or ovary. It provides option for targeted therapy as it was discussed in previous lecture, but the only hindrance is that the cost of the drug is 26,000 per month. Frankly speaking, uh, none of my patients has the benefit of this uh, Ola Parit because I think uh, we don't have the budget to sp sponsor this patient. One of my patients went to Australia because uh, I think she has some PR or what and she managed to get the treatment from there because she enrolled into the 
study over there in Australia. So reduction of cost for the BRCA testing and the drug will make it more successful. And in theory, virtually all BRCA-related ovarian and breast cancer are preventable if they do the test followed by the risk-reducing surgery. So this is my last slide. Miss Angelina Jolie come, come out on Times Magazine eh, after this risk-reducing surgery. And this is what she said. I do not feel any less of a woman. I feel empowered that I made a strong choice that in no way diminishes my femininity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamil, uh, for the very useful lecture. And it is such an uh, excellent and uh, quite uh, easy, I mean, feasible to do such a study uh, to our population. I think we don't have uh, much uh, in terms of um, data for, for our population. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so we still have a time uh, for the Q&A uh, session. Uh, for the all attendees, please don't, please don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A box at the right bottom corner of your screen. Do note this is different from the chat box. Um, there is a question from the floor uh, asking yeah. about how do you normally uh, do screening for the ovarian cancer in a patient tested a positive uh, BRCA mutation? It means that they are not affected, uh, but they are tested to be a positive uh, BRCA mutation. Okay, if they have positive BRCA mutation, what we do, we will refer them to the geneticist first. And usually, they will be offered screening. So for breast cancer, we will refer to the uh, breast endocrine team. Okay, usually if they are less than 40 years old, they will be referred for ultrasound annually. But if they are more than 40, they will be offered a mammogram plus minus MRIs. Whereas for ovarian cancer, we don't have any uh, proper way of assessment. So what we do, we tell them generally about six monthly, we will call them for uh, ultrasound uh, scanning. Okay. But uh, we don't offer CA125 unless we can detect any uh, ovarian cysts. So that is the way we screen the patient. But so basically using uh, ultrasound abdomen, yeah, bro? Uh, yeah. Dr. Jamin? Okay. Yeah, ultrasound sure. abdomen. Okay, I think I, get, I have another question from Vicky Rajaswaran. Uh, Dr. Jamil, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, may I ask if a patient is a BRCA mutation positive, but has declined to know her status, do you then mm -hmm. ask for permission to disclose to her family members? Uh, usually, we will ask them. Let's say if they are positive, but they refuse to disclose. So we have to, I mean, we don't ask for permission. Usually, I think this issue will be handled by the genetic counselor. If they are positive, we will refer them to genetic counselor. And I don't think we should uh, disclose to the family members if they don't agree. Maybe a genetic counselor can help me. Uh, to answer this question. The answer, Hi, yeah. Good morning, Dr. Jamil. That was yeah. a very nice talk. Uh, Dr. Sudiza, maybe I can take this question um, sure, regarding see. disclosure. So it is um, the prerogative of the patient because the positive results to the patient, but um, we will counsel and if the patient does not want to um, have the result, um, we do um, ask if they would like anyone else in the family that would like to know. But it is, of course, um, with written permission and authority from the patient. So there is a process for us. Uh, and it has happened where they would not want to know their results. Uh, most of the time, they suspect, but they don't want to see it on paper. Then they will give a written permission to have the result released to their next of kin. And then we will do that very confidentially and privately. So I hope that answers the questions um, that was posed just now. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Dr. Sugi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamil and uh, Sugi for the explanation. I think we move on with the next lecture. So who should consider genetic testing? The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, recommends BRCA1 or 2 or expanded panel testing only for certain people with an increased risk of having an inherited gene 
mutation related to breast cancer. Most of the women that are, we are seeing in the clinic who have a family history of breast cancer may think they should get tested. However, not everyone with a breast cancer in their family should run out to get this test. So as a clinician, we should decide who should go and who should benefit from genetic testing. We'd like to welcome the expert herself when it comes to selection of cases for genetic testing. Please join us in welcoming Prof. Datin Paduka, Dr. Teo Su Huang, who is a Chief Scientific Officer of Cancer Research Malaysia. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Suniza, for the kind introduction, and thank you to Prof. Um, Prof. Aisha and team for inviting me to give this talk. So we, uh, this phrase is really familiar to, to us now after Dr. Jamil's excellent talk, but I want to kind of remind ourselves what are the characteristics of BRCA carriers. So for BRCA1 carriers, the mean age of diagnosis for breast cancer is 44. This is from our data in Malaysia after um, doing sequencing uh, for about 8,000 breast cancer cases from Malaysia and Singapore. And for BRCA2, the mean age of diagnosis is 47 compared to an overall uh, mean age of diagnosis of 52. So what we know from BRCA carriers is they tend to develop the disease at an earlier age of um, di at diagnosis. The second is there's a different distribution of subtypes of breast cancer in BRCA carriers. And this is true only for BRCA1. So for triple negative breast cancer, 64% um, of BRCA1 carriers develop triple negative breast cancer compared to only 12.6% overall in the Malaysian and Singapore cohort. And number three, in terms of family history, um, there is family history of breast or ovarian cancer in first degree uh, relatives. That's at 30% for BRCA carriers compared to 14% overall. So these are three defining characteristics for BRCA carriers. Number one, younger age of onset. Number two, for BRCA1, uh, increased prevalence of triple negative breast cancer. And number three, family history of breast cancer. So in the past, uh, the reason why we would want to identify BRCA carriers is because BRCA carriers have a higher risk of developing uh, contralateral breast cancer, and therefore it may be warranted for them to have different screening strategies um, uh, in order to be able to pick up those cancers at an earlier stage. So it's estimated that whereas, um, previous slide please, Dr. Sunisa, Whereas uh, BRCA carriers have a 40% chance of developing contralateral breast cancer in 10 years, uh, non-carriers only have a 4% chance of developing contralateral breast cancer. And as you've already heard from uh, Prof. Marniza, um, BRCA carriers have a 40, uh, 20 to 40% chance of developing ovarian cancer. And this is different between BRCA1 carriers versus BRCA2 carriers. Next slide, please. So the second reason why it's important, not just in terms of risk management, is of course because of treatment. So as you have already seen these slides from uh, Prof Maniza this morning, that for breast cancer, there is now a difference in treatment for oloperib and telazoparib, where germline BRCA carriers do derive some uh, benefit, at least in progression-free survival, not yet in overall survival for treatment with oloperib. Next slide, please. This is also true for three other cancers. So you, the data here is just presented for oloperib, which is probably the more advanced than the other drugs, but there are other PARP inhibitors that are in development. So for ovarian cancer, germline or somatic mutation carriers derive a benefit. For pancreatic cancer, it's only germline carriers have been tested. And for prostate cancer so far, it's germline carriers for BRCA and ATM as well as somatic mutations for, um, for BRCA seem to derive a benefit from this uh, treatment. So moving forward, um, BRCA testing is not just important from a risk management perspective, and risk management is both for the breast cancer patient, for example, in considering her future risk of cancer in the opposite breast, as well as considering her risk of ovarian cancer, and for ovarian cancer patient to consider her risk of breast cancer, for example, but also important risk management for unaffected relatives in the family, for them to be able to consider what is their risk of breast and ovarian cancer and what they might do about that. But as I've shown in these slides, it's also important for therapy choice. And even though at this point, it may not be affordable to patients, it is something that patients may want to know, especially if the budget impact analysis that Suki and team are able to uh, organize 
shows us what the budget impact might be if we're able to pick this up um, through the Ministry of Health and through other sources of funding. Next slide, please. So I, I also want to point out that this is an area of very, very active, um, very, very active uh, research. And in the laboratory, we're starting to test what are the differences, what are the differences between BRCA tumors and non-BRCA tumors, and begin to see whether BRCA tumors will benefit from other sorts of treatment. So for example, we find that individuals with a loss of, uh, with, with, uh, for breast cancer with a high uh, um, homologous recombination deficiency have a low immune score and current trials are starting to test whether PARP inhibitors can be used in combination with checkpoint inhibitors to be able to improve outcome. So we're starting to be able to explore what are the consequences of BRCA um, loss of function, either by germline status or by somatic alterations. And hopefully by doing this, we will be able to develop more accurate and more um, better treatments that improve the outcome for BRCA carriers. Next slide, please. So given all of these, it's, uh, it's critical that we be able to identify who benefits from genetic testing. So in today's talk, I'm not really going to cover ovarian cancer because as, Prof, uh, as Dr. Jamal has already eloquently shown us, in ovarian cancer, it's not been possible to select for individuals who are carriers on the basis of family history. And uh, in the MAGIC study, as well as our previous study looking at about 300 patients from University of Malaya, we showed that um, family history was only present in about 40% of uh, BRCA carriers and, then, and uh, the majority, 60%, do not have family history. So we do need to be able to offer genetic testing to all patients who have non-mucinous epithelial ovarian cancer. This means that in the context of ovarian cancer, we would exclude all individuals with germ cell tumors and we would also exclude individuals with mucinous ovarian cancer. We've shown from previous data that the prevalence of BRCA mutations among mucinous, carrier, mucinous cancer patients is zero. And this is also true for many other studies that have now been reported in Australia, Canada, and the US. So let's look back at breast cancer. And unfortunately for breast cancer, the focus today is really, it's very difficult to remember this criteria, right? So I've given you a few minutes to read through this. And I've, if I close the screen and test you for how many you would remember, the reality is it's actually really difficult to remember these criteria precisely in the clinic. But the NCCN guidelines suggest that uh, testing should be offered to all patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 45, or if they have at least two additional breast cancers, um, breast can primaries, that means a bilateral breast cancer, for example, either in the patient themselves or in a close relative, or the, if they are diagnosed between the age of 46 to 50, then they would have to have uh, additional family history. Or if they're diagnosed less than 60 with triple negative breast cancer, or diagnosed with a family history of ovarian cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and breast cancer, under the age of 50. And the last criteria is of course male breast cancer. Next slide, please. Within the UK, they recognize that such criteria is very hard to implement within the clinic because it requires individuals to spend some time asking patients about detailed family history. So if you flip back to the previous slide, you'll see that many of the criteria, uh, Dr. Sunisa, the previous slide, please. You'll see that many of the criteria relies on being able to understand a family history. But as you already understand from Dr. Jamel, trying to collect family histories significantly expands on the time that is required to see a patient in a clinic. And that's actually very difficult for frontline oncologists such as Prof. Manisa and, and Dr. Jamel, or even breast surgeons to be able to roll out. So in, a, in um, the mainstreaming study in the UK, they took a different approach. So next slide, please. So Professor Nazneem Rahman from the Institute of Cancer Research in the Royal Marsden Hospital in London basically pilot tested this criteria. So this criteria does not rely on family history. It's information that you can get from the patient itself. The patient is diagnosed less than 45, diagnosed with breast can uh, bilateral breast cancer less than 60, diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer at any age, diagnosed with both breast and ovarian cancer in the same patient, and has male breast cancer in a close relative. So these are criteria that they pilot tested 
recognizing that it may be difficult for individuals to remember their family history or be able to take their family history accurately at the point of, of which you're trying to uh, provide information to patients. Next slide, please. So in our Malaysian and Singapore uh, breast cancer study, what we have now done is taken forward 8,000 breast cancer cases and 8,000 controls. In Malaysia, we have two sites, UM as well as SGMC. And in Singapore, we have seven sites or seven hospitals for the Singapore breast cancer uh, study and the population-based controls. So it's a very big study that we are testing rare variants. So we've now completed panel gene testing for 34 known or presumed breast cancer genes. We have a common variant analysis looking at the evaluation of polygenic risk, as well as the development of new polygenic risk um, that is built specifically for the Asian population. And our goal is to be able to develop an Asian specific risk calculator so that we can provide each woman with an individual risk of what, their, what is their risk of developing breast cancer, what is their risk of being a BRC carrier, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So within this study, um, this study has very recently, just last week, been accepted for publication in New England Journal of Medicine. So you should be able to see the results, hopefully within the next month or so. And in this study, it's a it's the largest um, international study that has looked at um, uh, breast cancer cases and breast cancer control and healthy controls. So far, about sixty thousand cases and fifty three thousand controls, and we're really delighted that um, through the contribution of Malaysia and Singapore, we were able to increase significantly increase in proportion of Asians that were represented in this study. So we included a gene panel sequencing, and I think the point to make here is that. Despite all of this testing, we really only found that seven genes were associated with a significant increase in risk of breast cancer. And the seven genes are listed there. They're BRCA1, BRCA2, PUB B2, and so on. And I think a significant point is also to report that the prevalence of BRCA1, BRCA2 is similar in the European as well as in the Asian population. And even and the only gene of the seven that is different between um, Europeans and Asians is actually a gene called CHEC2. And that's because of a founder effect mutation that's very common in the European population that's called the 1100 Del C mutation that is absent in Asian women. So next slide, please. So through this um, panel testing in a large cohort, we've now been able to go back and evaluate the clinical criteria. So I remember I mentioned to you the NCCN criteria in the US and the mainstreaming cancer genetics criteria in the UK. And on the right, I just show you an expanded NCCN criteria, which was a JCO paper that was published recently by Professor Fergus Couch from the Mayo Clinic. I'll walk you through this rather complicated slide um, uh, step by step. So if you look at the breast cancer uh, in the individual woman and pick out all individuals that are under the age of 45, then in our cohort, 25% of women have fulfilled that criteria and you would pick up 46% of the BRCA carriers would fulfill that criteria. If we look at uh, TNBC, then 7% would fulfill the criteria of less than 60, and 24% of BRCA carriers would be picked up. So if you work your way down this, then you'll find that if we use the NCCN criteria in our population, then 34%, roughly one in three breast cancer patients, would be referred for genetic counseling and testing. And that would enable us to pick up 61% of the BRCA carriers. That sounds pretty crap. 61% would mean that 39% or nearly 40% of carriers would be missed because they would never be offered genetic counseling or testing in the first place. If we, on the other hand, use the MCG criteria, then it's pretty similar. At 35% of the population, breast cancer patients would be eligible, and 62% of BRCA carriers would be picked out if we do not include family history. But if we now include family history, we're posed with a different problem. And the problem with nearly half of the breast cancer patients would need to be referred on to genetic counseling. And you would now be able to identify 75% of the carriers. So the trade-off here is very difficult because from a clinical setting, do you counsel and provide mainstreaming for all breast cancer patients or for potentially half of breast cancer patients in order to identify 35, uh, three in four of the BRCA carriers? But that would pose very serious challenges in the clinic itself because you would need to be able to provide counseling for a significant number of individuals. And it's even worse if we consider the expanded NCCN criteria, because as you see on the right, um, if we consider the criteria that's now being considered in the US, 
then potentially we need to offer counseling and testing to 86% of our patients in order to be able to identify 90% of our carriers. So in order to be able to circumvent this, we set about to try and evaluate different risk prediction models. So instead of using summary criteria like this, you can put them into a model that is then a computer-based model that is available and currently being tested in the UK as well as in the US for how you may be able to roll this out in surgical clinics, oncological clinics, as well as even in GP practices. Next slide, please. So there are many, many models. CanRIS has recently been approved by the FDA equivalent in Europe to be a clinical test that can be used in the clinic. But other models are more research models, such as Lambda, the Finnish model, and so on and so forth, the PEN model, uh, IBIS model. And the only Asian model here was uh, previously Asian model was the COBRA model that was developed for the South Korean population. Next slide, please. So we set about trying to evaluate what this means in our population. So Godesia is the same as Kenris. And what you'll see is the original design was from a population-based study and the back end is a polygenic, assumes a polygenic model in order to be able to calculate a woman's risk. And the performance of this model is very good. Its AUC is 0.7 to 0.51 and a perfect AUC is one. So, but if we evaluate the, the model that was set up in our own population, then we were able to uh, develop a model where the AUC is actually better than Bodicea in our population. So in our population, the EUC for our model is 0.77 to 0.81. That's the confidence intervals. And as you can see, PEN and COLCAL perform less well in our own population compared to the model built from our own population. Next slide. So this just shows you the AUC curves and I'd like you to focus in particular on the curve in black. And what you can see is that the curve in black shows that the performance is less good for Bodicea, Pen, and Colcal compared to what it is for B my BRCA. And the reason why it's less good for that is because it is very bad for BRCA2 carriers. So for some reason, the existing models do not perform well for, uh, for BRCA2 carriers but performs very well for BRCA1 carriers. And we suspect it performs well for BRCA1 because of the inclusion of ER negative status. So ER, as I mentioned, uh, nearly all bracket one carriers develop ER negative disease and therefore the inclusion of just that one criteria enables us to accurately identify bracket one carriers, but it doesn't do so well for bracket two carriers. And the reason why our model works better is because we think that our model includes grade Whereas all other models, the Bodicea, Pen2, and Colcalm do not include grain. So next slide. But we are very mindful that such risk prediction models, if you can't use summary statistics in the clinic, then trying to use a computer model in the clinic is already going to be very challenging. So next slide, please. So what we've now done is gone back and looked at the criteria and looked to see how we can take the learnings from our clinical criteria and our risk assessment model, the Malaysian risk assessment model, to be able to improve the criteria. So remember, the NCCN criteria on the right, I just show it here as a reference. You can pick up 34% of breast cancer patients will be eligible for testing, and you only pick up 61% of carriers. But the addition of grade and dropping the age of diagnosis to 40 rather than 45 enables us to not significantly change the number of um, individuals that we would need to screen. We would therefore be screening different individuals, but by doing that, we can increase the pickup of carriers. So we would be able to pick up 70% of the carriers. And our recommendation after this paper, hopefully is published, is to be able to change the Malaysian criteria and adopt this criteria because it's a more efficient way of identifying carriers in our own population. Next slide, please. So the challenge, as uh, Dr. Jamal has uh, alluded to, is of course the lack of access to genetic testing and the hesitation among healthcare professionals is really about uh, who to offer genetic tests to, particularly in the breast cancer setting. And what's the trade-off in the benefit of treatment versus the consequence of genetic discrimination, both for insurance, jobs, stigma, and so on and so forth. And then also how to interpret complex genetic test results. As you could see, Dr. Jamil and the other investigators within the MAGIC study were able to refer to a team of genetic counselors and clinical geneticists, and that enables um, appropriate experts to be able to take forward the really difficult discussions around what the genetic test results mean. Next slide, please. 
I'm really delighted that through the efforts of Suki, the genetic counselor, and a really great team of uh, investigators across all sites, we were able to recruit individuals, nearly 800 individuals to the study. 13% were BRCA carriers. And the main take home message is that there was no difference in satisfaction for genetic counseling. There was also no difference in cancer worry or distress among the patients who were in the mainstreaming arm compared to the, uh, compared to the referral arm. But what is significant is it dramatically increased access to genetic counseling and testing. So excess went from about 4% to we think close to 65%. And I think that increase in excess is something that we really need to think about if we're going to be able to increase equitable access to precision medicine in our population. But how are we going to do this for breast cancer? Next slide, please. So we are currently planning MAGIC 2.0, which is a breast cancer study. And the role of MAGIC 2.0 is to determine the impact of personalized risk on being a carrier um, in terms of uptake of genetic testing and genetic counseling. So in ARM1, we plan to provide patients with a leaflet with the Malaysian CPG criteria and determine how many call a hotline to figure out whether genetic testing is useful for them. And in the second ARM, we hope to work with clinicians to provide an ARICA score. ARICA is an Asian risk calculator and the ARICA score will give individuals their, their actual risk of, the, of being a BRCA carrier using a web app application that is currently in development. And we will be testing where, which one of these then increases the uptake, improves the access to genetic counseling and genetic testing. Next slide, please. So we're looking for investigators that hopefully will collaborate with us in this study. Please do get in touch with Suki. Sorry, a small pitch for advertisement for Suki. Please do get in touch with Suki if you're interested in taking part in the MAGIC 2.0 study. So in today's very short talk, I hope I've convinced you that identification of BRCA carriers helps to enable risk management and risk reduction among carriers. It enables the selection of appropriate treatment, particularly for breast, ovarian, and prostate cancer. Um, risk assessment using clinical criteria work, but models are more accurate. So the Eureka model, for example, that was built on the, Malaysia, the data from the Malaysia and Singapore cohort identifies 34% of breast cancer patients for genetic testing of which 81% of carriers are identified. But if we use a modified clinical criteria, then at the same levels, 34% of breast cancer patients will be identified. Only 70% of carriers can be uh, identified. So we would miss more carriers if we use just a simple clinical criteria. So we believe that mainstreaming increases the access to genetic testing and should be considered in uh, surgical as well as oncological clinics. And the next step is to evaluate mainstreaming for breast cancer. Next slide, please. I also want to share with you um, that we are currently also working on the genomics of Asian breast cancers. So I'm delighted to, to announce that our paper has just been accepted in Nature Communications. This is now the largest data set of um, genomics of Asian breast cancers. So some of you would have heard of the Cancer Genome Atlas that was uh, an effort led by the Americans with a thousand tumor samples being characterized or the Metabrick study, which was led by a combined group of between Canada and the UK, where about 2,000 samples have been analyzed. And so far before we started this study, the largest study in the Asian population was really only 50 patients at the time. We've now been able to uh, do the genomic profiles of 1,000 tumor samples. And I hope that this data will enable us to identify individuals that will benefit from uh, precision medicine. In particular, we've already started a trial called the Aura trial, looking at immune responses in uh, breast cancer patients with metastatic disease. And opening soon, and hopefully in Q1 next year, we will be opening the Tenor trial. And in the Tenor trial, we've already got funding. We, uh, we were able to get funding from Pfizer for an investigator-initiated trial to test whether telazoparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, will have any beneficial effects among non-BRCA carriers in a triple negative setting who have mutations in the, who have a homologous recombination deficiency as detected by a new test that was developed by Cancer Research Malaysia. So next slide, please. The, um, this is just a, the acknowledgement slide to say that I've talked in a lot today about research and research is not really possible without great teams. And it's really a, a lot of uh, members that, of the team that are within this um, that, that I haven't uh, fully acknowledged. And it's also possible because we receive charitable donations from a number of organizations, as well as research grant funding from different agencies. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Su Yi, and with a very interesting talk. And I think most of us will be confidently uh, after this assess uh, and select a patient to refer for the genetic testing. And congrats also uh, to Su Yi and Prof. Su, who are, uh, actively uh, participate to recruit all our cases for the genetic uh, testing. So just for a reminder, now we will have a 10 minute uh, Q&A session. Uh, please don't forget to type your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you for the opening talk. Sorry, I'm a bit confused. Can you explain again how the PARP, I work, uh, PARP inhibitor works? It seems like a good enzyme to repair damaged DNA, but we want to inhibit its function. It is correct. You know, PARP, uh, PARP is a good enzyme actually. Um, because it repairs uh, single strand breaks. So in any normal circumstances, we would not want to interfere its functions. So we have to remember this strategy of allowing PARP inhibitor to inhibit PARP uh, is mainly in patients with uh, BRCA mutation, right? Uh, really to create a lot of lots and lots of DSB, so double strand breaks that will overwhelm the ability of the cancer cells because you can't repair the double strand breaks well, such that it will result in cancer cell death. Um, and as you remember, in the, on the slide of synthetic lethality, cells without BRCA mutation will be able to be added damage. So in general, normal cells are usually uh, also affected by systemic therapy. In this case, of course, I think normal cells with uh, BRCA mutation, and, and this will explain the side effects that they get. But normal cells are usually more efficient at repairing themselves. So basically, you know, we, we try to leverage on this aspect to achieve a good balance between the efficacy of a drug controlling the cancer and the potential adverse effects of the drug itself. So yes, truly patient um, will get side effects of the drug, meaning the normal cells will also get uh, affected by this strategy, okay? But they would normally repair better than the cancer cells. I, I hope that would, answer that question and maybe the other question on SE, I assume that's this, that is side effects, right? I'll check. I might be completely wrong. Does it make sense to say patient with germline BRCA uh, suffer more SEs, I think that is side effects, from PARP inhibitor compared to schematic uh, BRCA only mutation? I think yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I must be honest, I don't think I have the answer to that, but I can understand the, um, the rationale Okay, because uh, those with germline uh, BRCA mutation means all cells will have the mutation. So potentially normal cells will also get affected uh, by the treatment more than perhaps with just somatic uh, BRCA mutation alone. But of course, bearing in mind, uh, in um, situations, for example, prostate cancer, uh, mostly I think, you know, germline and, and somatic may occur um, at the same time, right? I think as opposed to maybe breast cancer, I think uh, Prof. Su can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, uh, because I think in breast cancer, you know, usually it's mainly uh, the germline mutation, you get less of somatic mutation. But I, I think it's quite right to say maybe potentially they might get more side effects, but we don't have that uh, reported in studies for us to be able to confirm that that's correct. Yeah, thank, thank uh, Prof. Manisa, maybe I can add to this, because I think it's... Uh, yes, please. It's, it's, um, Sorry, sorry to jump in again, Prof. But kind of um, to go back to what is, uh, what is loss of heterozygosity and loss of the second allele. So if you think about it, all of the normal cells in a BRCA carrier would have one normal copy of BRCA1 or BRCA2 and one mutated copy uh, which they inherited that causes them to have a high risk. So when we are talking about risk, then having one allele alone increases your risk of developing cancer uh, for breast, ovarian, prostate, pancreatic, and so on. But when it comes to the tumor development, then in some tumors, um, like I mentioned earlier, for ovarian cancer, there's loss of both alleles. That means the wild type copy also is mutated, but only in the development of the cancer, it's mutated and its function is lost. So PARP inhibitors are more detrimental for the, for the cells that have loss of two copies. So in ovarian cancer, because um, both copies are lost in germline carriers, what happens is that there's a lot more detrimental effect of PARP inhibitors on the tumor cells 
compared to normal cells that don't have the loss of the second copy because the loss of the second copy only occurs in cancers. So the anticipation is actually the side effects of the PARP inhibitor have been very minimal. For many patients, the, the side effects are actually um, coming from um, other treatments and the side effects of PARP inhibitors appears to be relatively mild. But for, in the context of breast cancer, unfortunately, that case is not true. As I mentioned earlier, for BRCA1 and triple negative breast cancer, the loss of the second copy occurs very often. And that's probably why in a triple negative setting, there appears to be a better effect with triple negative uh, with PARP inhibitors. But for BRCA2 in particular, the loss of second allele in breast cancer doesn't happen so efficiently. And as a consequence, there may be less effect of the PARP inhibitors in those. And less effect means the same as less side effects as well, because there's less of a therapeutic window in order for you to get a beneficial effect from um, PARP inhibitors. Thank you. I hope that clarifies the, the, the yep. discussion. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. May, may I add something else? Sure, bro. Go okay. ahead. So I think, I, I think for my oncology colleagues out there, I, I think maybe we need to be um, uh, careful about the potential side effects of heart inhibitor. Of course, generally speaking, we know some targeted therapies have relatively um, low side effects, but there's certain side effect profile of heart inhibitor that we need to be careful of. One of it is myelosuppression because they tend to cause uh, pancytopenia, but mainly um, anemia and thrombocytopenia, and it can be up to even grade three. So I rarely see neutro neutro significant neutropenia, but it's mainly the anemia and uh, thrombocytopenia that can occur as early as within two or three weeks of treatment, and it can be up to grade three. So I had patients who platelet dropped until less than 50 and hemoglobin dropped until you know five or six. So I think we need to be very careful about that. I think if we manage, if we see them frequently and manage the side effects for, uh, well, it, it is potentially a safe drug, but, but it, it does have side effects, so we have to be careful. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Mardiza and Prof. Uh, Sue. Thank you for a reminder to all the oncologists because they will they will the one who give uh, this kind of treatment to the patient. So yeah, without further ado, we'd like to call upon uh, our next speaker who is a genetic counsellor in a cancer research Malaysia. She is also the head of familial research program. She is a graduate of the University of Cambridge. Ms. Sui has been involved in a Malaysian BRCA, breast, breast cancer my BRCA research project at the Cancer Research Malaysia since 2003. She is one of two certified genetic counsellors in Malaysia and is accredited by the Human Genetics Society Australasia. She will highlight us on the next topic of discussion, genetic testing and introduction about the decision 8 prototype. Please welcome Ms. Sui. Good morning, um, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to um, talk a little bit about genetic counseling for um, BRCA testing and also um, what we can do in order to um, support the process of counselling for patients and uh, what are the tools that we might possibly use to do that. So the previous speakers, Prof Marniza, Dr Jamil and Prof Tio, have um, discussed a lot about what the use of genetic testing is, um, how it can be done and what sort of criteria um, can be used for um, the selection of individuals who may benefit from genetic testing. I'm going to lead the discussion in a slightly different way and it'll be useful to actually think from a patient's point of view on what their needs are, particularly from the information side and the knowledge side um, and how we as the healthcare providers are able to help them in that journey. So very quickly, why do genetic testing in the first place? So for an individual, they would mainly be looking at more information that can help them understand on the cause of the cancer that they have had. It helps them to answer the questions on how about my children? How about my relatives? It may give them information that can help them decide on risks that are in their family members and gives them the opportunity to manage their risk. 
in addition and more so now, and it's becoming um, uh, even more important, the genetic tests will be used um, in many cases to make clinical decisions um, on the best treatment and drugs to be used or uh, risk management practices for the patient herself. And this changes the, the, the landscape on how counselling is done in those situations. So the whole concept of um, genetic counselling is to really give um, patients the ability to be able to make an informed decision. And an informed decision comes from only having all of the right information that are useful to them. So understanding the information of the condition, um, helping them to understand what's happening if there is a family history, what's going on in, the, in terms of inheritance, what are the options um, in terms of treatment that may be available that could be based on the genetic profile that they might have it does take into account the informed choices is based a lot in their own personal and family situations as well. And it is really to assist them so that they can adjust to the condition and the risk um, categories that they feel that they are in um, during this session. So some of the main things that needs to come across um, during the counseling session, be it provided by a geneticist or a um, non-genetics based uh, specialist like an oncologist or a surgeon or a gynae oncologist. So knowledge, the information about the genes, the test itself, the benefits and the limitations has to be laid out in a way that it's um, understood. And we know that you know, very clearly. And it's quite amazing to see how creative um, the surgeons and the oncologists are in putting this forward. I mean, um, the cartoon drawing by, uh, showed by um, Dr. Jamil and it was drawn uh, by Dr. Faiz. It's really quite amazing. Um, I mean, some of us counsellors don't have that sort of uh, artistic skills. So we do rely on uh, cartoon drawing that is printed or established. But in some format, these information about benefits and limitations has to come across. Sometimes we forget that there may be psychological consequences um, from knowing a genetic result because we get too caught up in trying to make sure that they understand the scientific genetic and uh, risk knowledge, right? But psychological consequences for some individuals, especially those who are already predisposed to depression or anxiety is actually quite important and we need to um, put that in, into the whole process. Helping them um, understand who in the family would benefit most in having the information shared. That is very important as well. And that is something we have to look into, particularly if there is a strong family history, right? Um, what happens if it's a positive or a negative result, even in a family history? So these are information that needs to be covered. And of course, Dr. Jamil has already alluded and he has got examples, confidentiality concerns. Um, it's a big issue for uh, Malaysian population, mainly because there are no legal guidelines on the use of genetic information. Um, we have heard anecdotal um, discriminations, particularly um, from the insurance, but there is nothing um, that is uh, very clear cut in the sense of how insurance uses genetic information. And because it is unclear, that gives a lot of uh, concern to uh, individuals who rely on um, medical insurance. So ultimately, the goal is to help an individual make the personal decision so that they are able to weigh it out and make a decision that they are comfortable with. So this is where counsellors come in. Traditionally, um, they'll be referred uh, for individuals who want to do a genetic test, will be referred to counsellors or uh, into clinical genetics clinics. And the whole point is to look at all of these influences in the whole decision making process. So we know that um, from a patient's point of view, apart from the knowledge, which is you know, a very big part and it's right in the center, that there are many other things that 
they consider um, before they make a decision on the test itself, right? The spouse, the significant other, family members. And I think um, as clinicians, you would also realize that shared decision making is not just between the clinicians and the patients. We You realize that um, it most of the time involves um, family members as well. And this is no different um, in genetic tests, particularly if um, it is from the inherited germline point of view. So there are other effects on, you know, uh, cultural, religious, and so on. And all of this actually influences how an individual may make a decision on BRCA testing. So we know that there are so many challenges in um, delivering uh, genetic counseling, mainly due to the lack of uh, or services that are able to support the whole nation. So that's why there are many uh, other models that are being tested out, including telephone genetic counseling. But we are heading towards the mainstreaming pathway because that has um, shown to be um, possibly feasible through the magic study. And as Prof. Yo has alluded, we will now move on to test it out in a breast cancer setting. It has got different challenges, but then that also helps us to um, look at different ways to overcome some of these um, challenges. So we know that there will be um, changes in the delivery of genetic counselling and it involves all healthcare providers um, from the genetic services to the oncologists to the surgeons and so on and um, teams that are involved as well. So what are the tools that we can use in order to assist the um, process of genetic counseling? Decision aid has always been shown to be one of the tools that could be used in this um, decision-making process. And decision aids are developed for what we call preference sensitive decisions. So it, it's supposed to take into account um, a patient's perception of the harms and benefits um, and designed to increase the patient's participation in decision making. So a decision aid um, in the background of developing it needs to meet um, this criteria, but it is important to note that the decision aid is to enhance. It does not replace the patient professional communication. So it is used together and it is not meant to uh, replace the counselling that is done by a healthcare professional. So the ultimate goal of a decision aid is to help a patient understand the risks and benefits. And we've looked at um, what those are already for BRCA testing. It's to help patients clarify their values. Now, this is a little bit more um, difficult and sometimes it's called an iffy science because how do you define values? You know, everyone has different sets of values. Um, but this is where um, decision aids have framework and how it can be um, modeled. It, that's very important. And having the right expertise in the development of decision aid is crucial in order to add in these portions. And ultimately, it is to help a patient make a decision that is consistent and that they're comfortable with. So I would like to um, introduce, uh, sorry, there seems to be one slide that's missing. Oh, sorry. Um, so this, is something that um, we as a team together with uh, in Cancer Research Malaysia together with uh, Prof Aisha in UMMC um, have decided to come up with a model for a decision aid that could be used for genetic counseling. So um, let me see if I can find the whole picture. Uh, apologies, I think one slide has just disappeared just before this. Okay, um, I'll just walk you through it. So what we have done is um, before coming to um, the um, A version of the decision aid, um, in the earlier part of the work, we did an exploratory um, information needs study 
where we use qualitative analysis and interviews with um, patients and uh, relatives of patients on what their needs are in a decision aid. Now, we have used the information that have come up from the exploratory study to adapt an ongoing decision aid that has already been used in uh, New South Wales in Australia for the past 10 years. So we've used that as the um, base of the decision aid and we incorporated all of our findings from our local population and came up with um, A, which is the first um, decision aid draft that we had. So we did an alpha testing for that decision aid and it was in uh, different languages. We translated it and we thought that it was actually quite a good way to uh, reach out to um, individuals who are thinking of um, doing the genetic test. However, when we came up with the thematic analysis of um, the alpha one testing, it was um, quite disastrous in a sense that from the patient's point of view, the decision, it was too difficult. Information and language was not easy to understand. Too many statistics, visuals, information were not uh, easily understood. So and from the health professionals as well, um, similar teams were pulled out. So after the alpha one testing, we had to regroup and redesign and it was a targeted revision. The whole point is it was not reaching the population that we wanted to reach out to um, in our own uh, uh, patient cohort. So a targeted revision was done. It was then we um, collaborated with a low literacy specialist who then helped us to rewrite it in a way that it has brought down the literacy level to what is known as grade six or just at primary school level. And a lot of work was done to kind of um, look at even how the graphics were drawn, how the illustrations were drawn and how to actually localize it so that it feels more Malaysian. Right. So a big lesson that we learned in adapting decision aids. So this is when we had the steering um, working group and the revision and the redesigning was done. And we had a low literacy version that on, went on to alpha two testing. So alpha two testing was with um, different um, focus groups again that involves um, primary local um, experts and also local patients. And it has come to a much more acceptable um, thematic teams that we've pulled out. So it, we had very positive um, response from this test in terms of comprehensibility. Um, it was actually uh, across the board um, that the format was a lot easier to use, um, although some still felt that it was quite lengthy. Um, and that's also because we have incorporated the decision aid to support both um, uh, testing for the proband and also for predictive testing for the cascade um, flow to family members. So it is quite uh, lengthy in that sense. In terms of acceptability, we also had very good response and um, the healthcare professionals felt that they will be able to use it in order to convey the messages that they want to if they were doing um, the counselling. And for feasibility, um, going through the entire um, decision aid seems to be manageable and we had very good response in terms of how it looks and appeal to the individuals that we tested it on. So we now have a prototype decision aid. Um, and I would like to just show you a little bit about this decision aid. So this is what um, it looks like from uh, the cover page and the booklet is meant for both um, breast and ovarian cancer patients and their family members as well. So there are sections inside that are that will be clear um, if whether the patient is the proband or whether it's a relative. Okay, and it spells out very, very clearly what the use of the booklet is and and also very clearly that 
they're not um, meant to be using it entirely on their own and then they'll be supported by a healthcare professional. But bearing in mind, this is a tool that is to be used so that it gives you something as a clinician to be able to work through um, the discussions about BRCA testing. Okay, the categories are um, also put in a very lay um, format. So very basic information about what genes are, what are faulty genes and how it can cause cancer, breast and ovarian cancer that runs in the family, the test itself, the impact of the testing. There are other parts which I will not um, go through, but it will end up with a worksheet. Um, and this is something that is done together with the healthcare professional. And working through the worksheet, it will help them come together to a, a value um, of whether they are more towards testing or not, and what is it that their concerns are, and how those can be um, overcome or you know, include further discussions with um, the healthcare professional. So with the prototype decision aid, we are now, the next step is to actually uh, embark on a larger user testing um, uh, a trial. And that will be done on uh, individuals who have never had any um, prior exposure to genetic counseling or testing. And we should be able to refine it better so that we will have a um, low decision, low literacy decision aid that can be used in the clinic uh, in, in due course. So in summary, um, I'd like to say that we have already concluded that BRCA genetic testing is important for risk management and treatment decisions, but the counselling is important. And the counselling needs to be able to help individuals make informed choices. And in order to support the counselling, we know that there are knowledge improvement tools that can be used. And we are looking at one such tool, uh, the decision aid um, to support genetic counseling, especially in mainstreaming. This is to ensure that, you know, that, um, the process when done in non-clinical uh, genetics um, facilities uh, can be carried out um, safely and effectively. So the decision aid that I have uh, talked about is developed to suit the local population needs um, from literacy level and it includes cultural and social sensitivities. And I'm also very pleased that in parallel, Prof Aisha and, uh, has also, together with her two PhD students, Hamiza and Grace, has also done decision aids for the next part, which is the risk um, management for breast and ovarian cancer risk. So I, I think it's amazing that we have now a set of decision aids from testing to risk management. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, roll this out um, in a short frame of time and uh, have it be uh, used clinically. So I would like to acknowledge collaborators and team members. The work on the decision aid was led mainly by um, Tiara and Daphne and uh, shout out to them for amazingly putting this together um, under very difficult constraints to um, our collaborators, um, particularly from the University of Sydney, who has been incredible in um, helping us to design and revise, particularly into the low literacy format. And of course, the um, acknowledgement to all of the funding bodies that have been supporting the project, but more importantly, and um, special thanks to patients and their families who have been participating in the My Braca, My Ofka, and the Magic Project um, that has led to all of the outcomes that we have today. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll take any questions if there are. Okay, thank you very much uh, to Mr. E with a very interesting and excellent talk. Uh, thank you also for sharing your experience as a genetic counsellor. And uh, congratulations for Sui and team uh, for the developing prototype decision. I think it's very useful uh, for all the patients to make a decision. I think you, we will have a Q&A session now. 
So there is a, one question uh, from uh, Adi. Uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, regarding indication for BRCA testing, if I understand correctly, it is offered or indicated in patients already diagnosed with breast cancer, plus other criteria mentioned. What about people from public who may have a relative with breast cancer or not, who wants to know their genetic state, uh, status, i.e. as a screening tool? And another one, would it be more cost beneficial to do, to do risk reduction surgery versus uh, getting a pulp inhibitor? Yes. Okay. So for um, individuals who uh, primarily currently, what we know about um, uh, for BRCA testing, it is, uh, of course, usually only offered initially, um, if we can, to the patient that already has developed the cancer. Right, and then it's based on uh, the criteria that was discussed earlier. Now, there are situations where, in some families that have got strong family history, and an uh, individual from that family may be very worried about the risk, but no one else um, is alive to do the test nor um, want to do the test. So in such cases, the individual you know, who is the relative has, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, can have counseling to decide whether they want to do the test itself. But of course, that comes with a full understanding that um, they are having a test while not being affected. So there will be some considerations on what a negative result will mean and so on. Right, But I think uh, maybe Prof Kyo can jump in here. This may change in future because there may be um, sort of other um, risk tests that can be used more for uh, unaffected public um, individuals. So would you like to say something about that? Absolutely. So I think there are two different risks that we, are think, that we think about. The first risk is what is my risk of developing cancer and what can I do to either detect it early or prevent it altogether? And the second question is, what is my risk of being a BRCA carrier? And how does that impact on either my risk of cancer or what can I do about it, right? But from a healthy woman's perspective, it's actually really what is my risk of cancer? And for that to happen, it's not really about should is a genetic test appropriate for me? It's really what is the accurate tool that can give me my, uh, my individual risk of cancer. Today, that tool is using lifestyle risk factors. So, for example, we know that women who have uh, more children have a lower risk of cancer. We know that individuals who have um, who breastfeed their children have a lower risk of cancer and so on. But we can't use these lifestyle risk factors accurately to predict the woman's risk of cancer. So the AUC for those lifestyle factors is really only about 0.52, not much better than tossing a coin compared to uh, for those lifestyle factors. So we're currently developing a tool that integrates a polygenic risk, the rare variant analysis, as well as mammographic density to be able to provide a woman with an accurate risk of cancer. Um, I don't think that genetic testing is indicated unless you have strong family history of breast cancer because in the other criteria such as you know triple negative disease or early onset disease and so on do not apply. So to the short answer to your question would be for a healthy individual that has strong family history of breast, ovarian, prostate and pancreatic cancer, we would strongly recommend that they see a genetic counsellor to understand what is their risk of being a BRCA carrier and what is their risk of cancer. And for individuals with no family history of cancer, I think currently the clinical recommendations apply, which is that if you are over the age of 50, you should have a mammogram every two years. If you're between the age of 40 and 49, you can consider a mammogram if you have family history of cancer within your family, um, close relatives with, uh, affected by cancer. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Prof. Su, with the um, answer for that uh, particular question. I think we can open an, uh, two more questions. Um, another one is, are there any specific points we should stress on as a clinicians when we counsel patients to see a genetic counselor for BRCA mutation testing. Yeah. Okay, so um, it 
as clinicians and as the frontliner in a sense, uh, it is really important that you are able to um, uh, refer right if if you are not doing the mainstreaming and if you feel that there are individuals that would benefit from counseling and testing so being aware of who to um, refer is um, uh, really important and very very useful then of course to just have a brief explanation to why the in to to the patient why you think that they may benefit from a genetic test and so on um, to open up the idea of having a genetic test to the individual. So that is um, very important. And usually that it doesn't need to go in detail, but some mention on what the risks and benefits are would be useful. Thank you, Sui. I think this is uh, more important uh, because as a physician or general practitioner, they just want to ask, may I know, do we need to refer all patients who wish to have a genetic counseling directly to genetic clinic? And if yes, is the genetic clinic is available in all main hospital in Malaysia? Thank you. Um, so there, there are those that should be referred because you think that they will benefit. So either they're in a high risk group or they may benefit in terms of the treatment point of view. But there will always also be individuals who, um, like what Prof. Su has alluded, are worried about their cancer risk, but may not actually... Um, but may not actually uh, benefit from one of the standard um, high-risk genetic tests at the moment. So, but you cannot also tell them, you know, uh, don't worry about it, lah. You know, you don't have to do anything about it, you know, because that's not going to stop anyone from asking or even going to get information from sources which are not recommended. As you know, the internet is filled with all sorts of information that <laughs> uh, may not be correct. So, it is always prudent that if someone is keen to um, refer and then the clinics will filter through. The genetic clinics are available in um, four hospitals at the moment for the government sector. So uh, in uh, UMMC and it's led by Professor Tong uh, in HKL, um, there is a clinic in HUKM and in HUSM as well. So these are the government hospitals that have the um, clinical genetic services that you can refer to. Uh, sorry, Dr. Suniza, if I can add to that, though, from a, um, I think there are two things that I, I feel, you know, clinicians, especially if you are the primary treating doctor, you have already established trust with your patients. You are in a very strong position to be able to inform and educate um, an individual and their family members. So number one would be, I think it's important to emphasize that Early stage breast cancer is a curable disease and early stage ovarian cancer has a dramatically better outcome than late stage disease. And today, you know, even though BRCA carriers have got a high risk of these cancers, actually, um, if, um, if prevention options are available, it can result in good outcomes, right? Good survival from cancer or good prevention of cancer. So prophylactic oophorectomy in particular is very highly acceptable to a large proportion of BRCA carriers, especially those that have finished having their families. So I, I think it's really to try and get rid of that stigma first because patients are very fearful of genetic discrimination. You know, we heard from Dr. Jamil that they are very concerned about what does this mean for my family? Will it result in discrimination? Will it be worse than not having a test at all? So their, their starting point, I think, is fear and reluctance to go forward, even to get more information, right? So perhaps as the referring clinician, the priority is to reassure um, individuals that there is some benefit to be able to uh, understand their risk or their family's risk and that uh, these cancers can have a good outcome and maybe that will open the door for, for people to come forward for more information. That's all that we, I think, can aim for, get, get more individuals to come forward for more information. Thank you very much uh, to Prof. Su and Su Yi for the very uh, good explanation. Uh, we have another two more questions, but I think we should uh, move on with our next lecture. So next, uh, let's let us welcome our external speaker, Prof. Dr. Owen Ang, to talk about risk management for inherited breast cancer. 
Professor Owen Ang is a breast cancer surgeon and also specialized in endocrine surgery. After graduating from the University of Queensland, he worked in a rural and metropolitan hospital throughout the state, then completed his advanced surgical training at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. From there, he undertook a fellowship at Westmead Hospital in NSW, then at the University of Wales College of Medicine in the UK as a lecturer in new surgery. From 1995 to 2008, he was a consultant a surgeon at Westmead Hospital where he headed the breast and endocrine surgical unit and was a director of the Department of General Surgery. He obtained a clinical associate professorship with the University of Sydney. From the beginning of 2009, he returned to Queensland to head the breast and endocrine unit at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital and joined the academic, academic department of surgery of the University of Queensland. Please welcome for Owen Ang. Thank you. Thank you very much to organisers for asking me to present. And um, I'm sorry if I have to join you at this late stage. We're in the process of exams here in Australia for our college. Um, um, but thank you for, for allowing me to join a little bit later. I'm going to talk to you from an Australian perspective, of course, on the risk management for inherited uh, breast cancer. In the normal population, in our normal population, I'm sure you'll find the same. The, the risk of developing breast cancer in a lifetime is about one in eight. But of course, that is related to the age at, the, um, at any given time. So that is a lifetime risk. And this is often misunderstood. Uh, now, if you talk about the average age of getting breast cancer is about 60. Um, and, and so it's not really correct to say that one in eight young women get breast cancer. Breast cancer is really a cancer of, of slightly older women. However, um, in this particular cohort of patients, um, we, we are talking about a small, smaller percentage of the patients that I see uh, in my clinic. Uh, the main risk factors for getting breast cancer, of course, are being female, increasing age, uh, and importantly, family history. So inherited breast cancer or hereditary breast cancer is really a cancer of young women and um, the risk of developing breast cancer for this group of patients may be uh, three in four in a lifetime. But bear in mind that about a quarter of these women, uh, if, never, if never treated, would never develop breast cancer. And of course, that's related to Hudson's two-hit hypothesis. So uh, unlike um, the normal population has two functioning normal genes uh, and are influenced by environmental and somatic factors, these particular patients are born with a germline mutation uh, and uh, have already had one hit and therefore um, environmental factors is far more likely to induce cancer at an earlier and younger age. And of course, the types of breast cancers that you've all been talking about, I'm sure, have been um, predominantly BRCA1 and BRCA2, but of course there are those list of other types of uh, syndromes and genetic abnormalities that lead to a higher risk of breast cancer. Of all the breast cancers I would see, um, I, I tell my patients that uh, seven to eighty percent are, are non-genetic. But of course, probably every cancer is genetic in some form. It's just there's something about the woman who gets breast cancer is probably genetically different from the woman who never does. Uh, but in this particular group of patients, which represent about five or ten percent, the majority of those will be BRCA1 and BRCA2 patients, and then. And then there's another group of patients and 15 or 20% when you take the family history, it's pretty obvious that there must be a genetic predisposition and yet we haven't yet identified those particular genes or those particular um, families. And, and you'd be familiar with the identifying patients for genetic screening, those with three or more relatives on one side of the family, but particularly if there are close relatives with both breast and ovarian cancer, um, or, or if there's bilateral breast cancer in the family. And of course, we, if, if there are male breast cancers, we would routinely test their families. We would routinely test, genetic test, uh, any woman who presents uh, under the age of 30 with breast cancer. And of course, we would routinely uh, um, test um, people with an uh, Ashkenazi Jewish um, ancestry. So this is the typical patient uh, who uh, would be a red flag for me, a 36-year-old woman, 
who presents with a, a triple negative breast cancer. This is the uh, common phenotype uh, for the BRCA1 type uh, patients. And, and yet you look through her family history and you'll see that um, everyone on her side of the family here in the immediate family are well. Um, but going further back, you can see on the paternal side, a paternal grandmother who's had breast cancer and then an aunt and, and uh, another aunt who've had breast and ovarian cancer and then a cousin with breast cancer at a young age. And, and we don't really need a genetic test to tell us that this woman almost certainly has a hereditary breast cancer. So these, there are considerations in treating women such as this who are affected individuals. What is their long-term prognosis? What is the risk for the contralateral breast? And then there are all the issues related to reconstruction if they were to go ahead and have a mastectomy. And, and as you've all been talking about prophylaxis both for ovarian and breast cancer. Uh, these women are gonna have particular issues relating to fertility um, and their social circumstances. They may or may not have a partner at that point in time. Um, and and um, that, that they may not be ready to accept prophylaxis uh, because something like a prophylactic mastectomy is, is, very, is very confronting. So in terms of deciding what sorts of treatment for the woman presenting with, a, with an early breast cancer, uh, but with a, a likely hereditary predisposition, um, it's, it's not automatic that these women will always choose to have a mastectomy or indeed a bilateral mastectomy. Um, what we know is that breast conserving surgery can be done for these patients and quite successfully. Um, their risks of regional and distant recurrence aren't really any different from any other woman who has not got hereditary cancer. Um, they do have a slightly higher risk of um, local failure, um, but it, that's probably more related to just the fact that they're young women, because we know that young, younger women have a higher risk of local failure, they have a higher risk of local recurrence overall compared to older women. So um, there, there has been quite a trend, uh, certainly in our environment, to encourage these women to have bilateral mastectomies. Um, but uh, you know, quite often these women just aren't ready for a mastectomy and will choose conservation. And they should be able to do that. And we should be able to advise them that that is a perfectly safe option. Uh, but it does mean um, that they, they need some surveillance ongoing and they need surveillance for the other breast. Um, so what is the risk of contralateral breast cancer uh, in these women who have already had a primary cancer? Um, we know it's greater for BRCA1 than BRCA2 patients, but it's significant. Um, certainly, I usually quote them somewhere between 40 and 50% for a contralateral breast cancer at some time in their life. Um, if you look at the studies, 63% for BRCA1, 17% for BRCA2. If we give them chemo prevention, uh, so they may receive tamoxifen, for instance, if they're premenopausal and they're estrogen receptor positive, that might give them some protection to the other breast. Um, if they're postmenopausal, they might receive aromatase inhibitors. That may give them some protection to the other breast, as will a, a self and go -oprectomy. But I'll go on to speak later about chemo prevention because it's more likely to have an effect on potential ER positive cancers. It's not going to have any effect on um, the triple negatives or ER negative cancers. So um, it's questionable whether um, in this scenario or even in in chemo prevention, uh, whether we're actually going to end up with fewer deaths by chemo prevention, but we may we may have fewer breast cancers. So the important considerations in the woman who has been diagnosed with breast cancer um, is their risk tolerance, um, their hormone receptor status, uh, and the prognosis of their primary cancer. Because at the end of the day, it's their primary cancer which is going to determine their long-term prognosis, not whatever risk they are of getting a second cancer. If they get a second cancer, it's most likely that that's going to be detected early. So uh, in managing women with BRCA1 or 2 associated breast cancer, um, you can look at this. So this is a, an older study, but still very relevant uh, one by um, Lee Benz uh, and published in 2007. Overall, what they found was high numbers uh, um, treated uh, with mastectomy, no increased risk of radiation toxicity. Um, uh, overall, um, uh, these patients tended to have more chemotherapy than 
um, hormone therapy, but that's understandable as well because this is a younger cohort of women and more often they're younger women with higher grade tumours, more ER and PI negativity and, and therefore this group of women often uh, are receiving more chemotherapy. Um, when comparing uh, these affected women with hereditary cancers to uh, controls, uh, there wasn't any difference in ipsilateral, um, ipsi, uh, lateral breast cancer tumour uh, recurrence. Um, there, was, um, there was a higher chance of a new primary um, and, and, and recurrences tended to be new primaries rather than recurrences, but there was no difference in survival comparing to match controls. Um, so, um, and, and contralateral breast cancer um, understandably occurred in 25 to 31% of patients in comparing those two cohorts. Um, so, um, younger women, uh, more frequent uh, ER negativity, uh, and the safety of hormone replacement therapy in these high risk women. Um, is something that needs to be considered. Often uh, these women uh, will be considering self-engorophorectomy, not only as prophylaxis, but can also be part of their treatment strategy. So um, young women may need to think about uh, prophylactic mastectomy um, as well as contemplating by self, bilateral self-engorophorectomy. Uh, one of the problems with an early bilateral self-engorophorectomy is uh, premature menopause and what we really don't know is the long-term effects of uh, a much earlier menopause so the recommendation generally is uh, even in these hereditary uh, cancers if a cell bingo is performed um, it's recommended to have hormone replacement therapy at, at least until they're close to the natural menopausal age um, the, the paradox uh, and the reason why uh, mastectomy should at least be this, at least discussed with these young women is that um, they, if, the, if they don't have that long discussion about um, what they would do for the contralateral breast. So the young woman who presents to me with a new breast primary, often small, not really thinking about their hereditary risk, finds it very hard to understand why you're talking about bilateral prophylactic mastectomies, bilateral mastectomies for such small cancers. The problem is this, if they undergo conservation surgery on the affected side, and yet down the line, they're thinking of prophylactic surgery for the unaffected side, you end up with this very par paradoxical situation where they've had a breast removed that's normal and they have, they've had a breast conserved uh, that's had cancer. So as difficult as, as it is, those discussions have to, have, have to be done early. So uh, young age, uh, not BRCA status is associated with high risk of ipsilateral breast cancer tumour recurrence. Um, and um, I, I might just skip over this slide and um, but just say that consider further conservation for the woman who presents late. So if a woman um, may have had conservation surgery for a breast cancer at a time when she wasn't aware of her hereditary status, uh, presents to you now and uh, with confirmed hereditary status, I think the right treatment for that woman is not to discuss necessarily, I mean, give her the option, but a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy uh, for, for a second contralateral breast cancer is not necessarily the way to go. Um, often for these women who've already had conservation on one side, um, the best treatment is conservation for the second uh, contralateral breast cancer. And then they have symmetry and, and then they have better cosmesis and their outcome it is just as good. So now uh, going on to women uh, with, uh, who are unaffected and that's the typical woman who comes to me for advice on um, what do I do? Um, I've got a high hereditary breast cancer risk of somewhere between 50 and 80 percent and maybe a lifetime risk of ovarian cancer somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. We know that familial cancers uh, tend to occur at a younger age and that risk is lifelong. So the considerations uh, are the utility of surveillance, 
um, prophylactic procedures, whether that be surgery or chemo prophylaxis. And then if we are talking about surgery, uh, the issues around uh, reconstruction. And the very deep uh, and, and uh, the very deep and complicated conversations, as your other speakers have already alluded to, uh, are that uh, cancer fear, self-esteem, um, what are the problems with premature menopause, what are the issues with social circumstances, and fertility in particular uh, for younger women. Um, it's interesting, if you, if you look at these slides here, and you'll see in the top left-hand corner, um, the difficulty for these young women is the highest, the most significant factor for them is a breast cancer risk, and that tends to be at a younger age, whereas ovarian cancer uh, it tends to be a risk increasing at a slightly older age. Having a prophylactic mastectomy, though, for women in this age group is highly confronting. It's not something uh, that they can accept easily, and yet this is a time when they're most at risk. As they get older, a lot of that risk is starting to dissipate. Um, Ophorectomy is something that is physically um, more acceptable for them because um, there's, there's no obvious physical abnormality. However, the physiological consequences of ophorectomy are far more profound. And again, it's another paradoxical situation. The other thing to really note is what is the age of that woman when she presents to, to, to you? Because if she is presenting you it, to you in the in the in her twenties or early mid twenties, then we know that that lifetime risk of breast cancer here, and that lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is going to continue is, is quite high, reaching something like forty or sixty percent in their lifetime, and, we're, and yet the normal population is following this risk trajectory. However, if a woman presents to you later in life, say at forty. Um, she's already lived out some of that risk uh, to the age of 40. She, she hasn't yet developed breast or ovarian cancer. And so that her risk going forward is not as high as the younger woman. And likewise, when a woman presents at the age of 60, having just discovered that she has uh, a hereditary predisposition gene, but as yet has not developed breast or ovarian cancer, then their ongoing risk is probably not much higher than the average population and you have to question whether um, anyone should be doing a radical uh, interventional surgery like prophylactic mastectomies or, or, or maybe even prophylactic ophrectomies. Having said that, I think that there's very little to lose for a postmenopausal woman having a laparoscopic self and go correctly. And I'm, I'm very encouraging women to do that. And, and largely in that age group, they're accepting of that. Um, another way to look at this is, um, and these, these are tables produced by Graham Southers, um, if you look at the risk of breast cancer, and this is an annual risk in the average population, you see this, um, this risk increasing with age, as, as we're well aware of, likewise for ovarian cancer. If you look at the patients with the BRCA2 mutation, you see that risk of ovarian cancer increasing with age, uh, and there's a significant difference between a one in 300 risk in your 20s versus a one in 15,000 risk for the average 20 year old woman. Um, but you'll see when you get to the ages of 50 or so, um, that there's still a significant tenfold risk difference for the hereditary BRCA2 uh, woman compared to the average population. But when you get to your 60s, that risk is starting to decrease. And the difference between uh, risk in your 60s uh, for the woman with the BRCA2 mutation and the general population it is not, not nearly a, as significant. And these tables uh, for BRCA2 are very similar to the tables I showed you in the previous slide. So what is the breast surveillance protocol? Um, at, at our institution, we would start screening uh, in the mid 20s. Um, certainly for the women under the age of 35, we alternate an MRI and ultrasound scan six monthly. Um, I'd always do a baseline mammogram and, and repeat that baseline mammogram at the age of 35, mainly because everyone is different. Some women at the age of 35 have 
um, a lot of fat replacement and mammography is a very useful study and someone at the age of 35 still have very, very dense breast tissue and need to continue on having regular MRI scanning. So MRIs are usually continued to about the age of 40, 50, and then at the age of 50 or so, normally um, surveillance can be done with conventional screening uh, mammography and ultrasound scan. And at that point in time, um, although we run a high-risk clinic and uh, women attend our QBRCA clinic, we would normally discharge them from our clinic at about the age of 50 to their general practitioner for regular surveillance if by that time they've not developed a, um, a breast or ovarian cancer or, or if at that time, um, so often before that time, they've, they've chosen to have prophylaxis. And once they've had prophylaxis, I would then discharge them from my clinic. So MRI, um, of course, is an evolving experience, but um, there's no doubt that it's very beneficial for these women with dense breasts. So it's a it's our it's our go-to mode of screening for for young women uh, with this high hereditary risk. Um, and um, again, this study is uh, all but a landmark study, the Marib study, where. Um, looking at the utility of MRI scanning in these women with a, a higher risk of breast cancer. And MRI by itself was shown to have a sensitivity of 77% versus 40% in this particular group of women. And the advantage occurred um, uh, when both modalities were used with a sensitivity of 94%. But it was particularly pronounced in the BRCA1 carriers um, detecting 13 uh, cancers um, uh, uh, um, versus uh, with a 92% sensitive versus 23% uh, in the um, uh, other cohort. Um, the mammographic um, features of breast cancer in young uh, symptomatic women, um, uh, sensitive 84% with standard surveillance. But increasingly, um, digital mammography and tomosynthesis have added another dimension of screening to these particular patients. So it, it may be if MRI is not available, available, but you have good quality 3D mammography with, um, with the ability to uh, do tomosynthesis as well. Um, these, these are going to be much more sensitive than the conventional mammogram used um, in studies like the Marib study. Um, but um, certainly uh, MRI would be our investigation of choice and, su and surveillance um, in the younger woman in particular. So getting on to prophylactic surgery and what strategies we have, um, we, we offer prophylactic surgery um, for all individuals who are, are confirmed, who have a genetic status confirmed. There will be some individuals who choose not to be tested uh, and clearly they have a very um, high chance of, uh, of having a hereditary cancer just on family history aspects alone. But it, it, they need to be counselled very carefully um, if, they, if a woman is requesting prophylactic surgery but has, has not been genetically verified. There are those women who um, we really have no choice um, but, to, but to act on, on a, an assumption when we can't confirm a genetic status. And for those women, we would say, of course, there's a, there's an, it's an autosomally dominant uh, 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 inheritance. And therefore, the reality is for a woman who we've not been able to identify a, a hereditary cancer, and yet we have a family history very suggestive of it, um, they've either got a 60 to 80 percent risk of um, developing breast cancer in their lifetime or their risk is no different from the general population and so it's a 50 50 um, bet and and that's they're the women who have a very difficult discussion occasionally uh, a woman will come to our clinic and requesting prophylactic mastectomies um, but have just decided that they're, they're not going to undergo genetic screening and, and I must say for those women uh, who have the ability to be tested and are requesting prophylaxis but refusing testing, 
I'm very reluctant to go forward uh, with prophylaxis uh, in those women. Um, when a woman has diagnosed breast cancer, um, then um, the discussion is, is somewhat easier. And, and some of these women who've known their genetic status, um, surprisingly, they, they come to you when they eventually get breast cancer. And I've had a few women like that who I've been following for a few years and they've been putting off their prophylaxis. Uh, but when it happens, um, they, they've even said to me, look, I'm, I'm relieved. I knew it was going to happen at some time. Now I've got it. Let's get on and, and get it treated. Um, this, this graph here shows um, the risk of uh, developing breast cancer. Uh, in, in a woman with BRCA1 and the risk of developing o, um, ovarian cancer. Uh, but with prophylaxis, um, mastectomy or oophorectomy, that risk is not going to be zero, but, but can be reduced down to below the population risk. And um, quite possibly oophorectomy will lower the breast cancer risk um, by about 30 to 50%. Um, but as we'll go on and discuss, and maybe that's just going to prevent uh, ER positive type cancers. So if we look at the prevention strategies, um, we all know the results of the IBIS-1 study where tamoxifen was used as prophylaxis and in the IBIS-2 study, aromatase inhibitors. These resulted in a 50% risk reduction for ER positive tumours and DCIS, but they had no effect on ER negative tumours. So there was overall um, possibly no reduction in actual deaths from breast cancer. Um, so we may be pre preventing ER positive tumours, uh, but we're not preventing ER negative tumours. And, and we all know that the, a typical phenotype in these, in these BRCA1 patients are the, are the triple negative um, poor prognosis tumours. So I think it's still controversial out there uh, with chemo pro prevention. But it's certainly uh, everyone should have that discussion. Currently, uh, there's a BRCAP trial of denesumab, uh, which is a, a rank L inhibitor. Interesting, this, this, this is a monoclonal antibody that um, seems to have a, a benefit in preventing bone fractures, and, uh, but it also seems to have a, an effect in, in, in mammary tumor genesis. So it may be that we're going to find a better prophylaxis uh, in a strategy other than um, just something that, that, that blocks hormones. Um, talking about, and I'm going to leave uh, chemo prophylaxis at that point uh, and talk about uh, well, what are the benefits of prophylactic mastectomy, therefore, if a woman has made that choice. Um, again, this is an often quoted study uh, from Hartman, which is a retrospective study of all women with family history of breast cancer who underwent bilateral prophylactic mastectomy at the Mayo Clinic um, over a uh, over a 30 year period. There were 639 women uh, with a median follow up of about 14 years and the expected incidence of breast cancer, um, just looking at uh, the Gale model was some 37.4 breast cancers, uh, but the actual in those patients that had had prophylactic mastectomy was four uh, with a risk reduction therefore of about 90%. So I think it's fair to, to say that um, we would expect a risk reduction of more than 90% for women who undergo uh, prophylactic mastectomy. Um, so what are the reconstructive considerations? Um, um, in, in my practice, uh, we do far more um, implant-based reconstru reconstructions for women who choose to have reconstructions after mastectomy. And then autologous, but autologous is certainly a very good reconstruction, um, but it may not be ideal for these young women uh, in all circumstances. One of the problems with bilateral autologous tram reconstruction, for instance, is the weakening of the abdominal wall. And a lot of these women are very physically active. Um, they're planning future pregnancies. So I would normally recommend for these very young women to um, either have no reconstruction or delayed reconstruction or immediate with implant-based reconstruction, they can always come back at a later date and have a tram reconstruction if they wish to. Um, but I would say in terms of the aesthetic, um, a tram reconstruct, an autologous reconstruction is going to give, for the woman who wants uh, a natural feeling breast, is going to give her uh, um, a better result 
than an implant based reconstruction, uh, but it's a significantly bigger operation and there is the comorbidity of having to take tissue from, a, from another part of the body. So um, many women uh, are going to request immediate reconstruction if they get to the point where they're going to have a prophylactic mastectomy. Bear in mind uh, radiation, um, if they've had previous treatment before, might affect those that reconstructive op that outcome. And also, if you're actually treating all with breast cancer with planned radiation, that, that could also have an effect on the cosmetic outcome. Um, the most basic form of reconstruction is uh, an implant placed subpectorally after a mastectomy, such as this. And then um, that implant is expanded over a, a period of time, um, over a number of months, and then replaced with a, um, a silicon implant. Uh, now, looking at this picture, there's no doubt that um, this woman's had a, a, a mastectomy and reconstruction. Uh, there isn't symmetry. Um, it's obvious, but um, if you're after a functional result, this will give a very good result. For the woman who has bilateral mastectomies with this type of reconstruction, again, it's obvious that she doesn't have two normal breasts, um, but if she's after a shape and a cleavage, then this type of implant-based reconstruction uh, can give a very good result. Um, the debate over whether the nipple should be spared, there's no question that preserving the nipple is a better aesthetic. Um, it can be done safely, um, but there is this is going to be the necessity to leave a very small amount of breast tissue and therefore a slight risk of recurrence in that area. In the study by Hartman, uh, seven breast cancer occurrences that occurred occurred in the women that had undergone a subcutaneous mastectomy as, as opposed to a, a total mastectomy. But the risk of that is so low um, that in order to uh, give better pro, uh, in order to provide better cosmetics, I think nipple sparing mastectomy must be part of the armamentarium uh, of a breast surgeon and offered to women because um, women are likely to accept a, a significant reduction in risk of breast cancer and a very, very slight risk by leaving the nipple if they can obtain this sort of result. So a woman with um, a B or a C cut breast um, with, with a breast that hasn't become too totic can get a cheaper result where we just take out the breast tissue and replace that with an implant and give them quite a satisfactory uh, result post mastectomy. This is one of my patients that I treated just in the last month or two. Um, she's a, a small A cut breast. Um, she actually um, wanted to have immediate reconstruction and be a bit larger. So um, we placed tissue expanders and expanded those. In order to do this, Again, the nipple has to be not toast and not in, in, in too low a location. Um, but when she's replaced with silicon implants, um, she ends up with um, quite, quite a, a good profile. Not perfect, um, but, but a reasonable profile and, and a result that she can be happy with. Um, uh, an autologous reconstruction, on the other hand, uh, takes um, a paddle of tissue, sometimes with muscle, sometimes as a pedicle. Uh, flap, sometimes uh, a microvascular and anastomosis. And in this woman here, she has a paddle of skin from the abdomen, uh, an autologous reconstruction, and a nipple which has been nip, uh, reconstructed and tattooed. Um, as you can see from here, the uh, in our uh, an earlier group of women with BRCA1 and 2, take up of prophylactic mastectomy, not as high as oophorectomy. Um, but that is changing and more and more women are coming to our clinic uh, requesting uh, prophylactic mastectomy as soon as they finish their family. And, I, and I've got no doubt that um, in the early 2000s, uh, Angelina Jolie's pronouncements have had, certainly in our developed uh, countries, has had a, uh, quite a significant impact in the women who are prepared to look at prophylactic mastectomy. Um, I think you've already talked about who did uh, refer to genetic testing, so I'm going to slip over that slide. Um, we we um, have uh, national uh, breast and ovarian cancer guidelines uh, as to uh, those patients uh, with a moderate risk or a potentially high risk that need to be referred to uh, genetic 
um, screening and counselling, and counselling is critical. Um, we tend to base our decision making, uh, and, and you may, I'm not sure what you use in Malaysia, but there is obviously there's the EDQ guidelines, um, um, uh, risk management for BRCA1 and 2. Um, uh, we, we often have some national guidelines of our own, and there are the, the NICE guidelines as well. Um, in summary, um, genetic counselling is essentially is essential. Um, annual mammography, ultrasound for younger women with breast tissue, with dense breast tissue, and MRI for younger women. Uh, ovarian screening we know is unreliable in the long term, so I. I'm, I worry much more about the ovaries than I do for the breast. A woman who chooses not to have prophylactic mastectomy, I'm quite comfortable that we can safely um, survey those uh, with good quality mammography and, and, and MRI and probably find any new cancers at a very early stage. Uh, prevention, I think, is still controversial. It's there. I discuss it with my patients. Um, the take up isn't really very high. Um, and we've talked about prophylactic surgical procedures. So I'm going to, I'm just going to now end that and um, stop sharing my screen. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Owen Ang, for such a great and excellent uh, presentation. As we are behind the time, I think we can have uh, one question uh, from the floor. Uh, from Nadia asking, what is your experience in counseling BRCA carriers who may decline further screening tests due to worry or stress or denial? Thank you. Um, yeah, look, you can't make any woman come to screening. Um, you know, I try to provide them the information. Um, if they decline screening, um, there's, there's not a lot we can do, but most women will be prepared to have screening. I think that the, the difficult thing is, is prophylaxis. That's something that they have quite a lot of difficulty with. But that is changing a lot. Um, and with good counselling and long-term follow-up, a lot of women will eventually come around um, because at the end of the day, the most efficient um, way to prevent cancer in these women is prophylaxis, surgical prophylaxis. Uh, thank you, Prof. So, so, Prof, I just want to ask you a question. Do you have any experience of... Um, I mean, prescribe, uh, prescribe, prescribe a patient for chemo prevention uh, using a reloxifen uh, compared to tamoxifen. Or uh, yeah, is, is there any difference in between both of these medications? Yeah. They're pretty similar. So if you look at the reloxifen trials and tamoxifen trials, look, I think as a, you can generally say that chemo prevention is going to uh, reduce the risk of breast cancer by some, you know, thirty to fifty percent. As I said, the, the IBIS studies have told us that. But the difficulty is that they are going to prevent ER positive tumours. And we haven't seen necessarily a, a reduction in mortality. Uh, so yes, a reduction in the number of breast cancers, but we're preventing probably the good type cancers. We're not preventing the, the, you know, the high grade triple negative type cancers. So. Um, that discussion you've got to have with a woman, uh, and 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 many women may still accept that they're quite happy to take some chemo prevention, but by and large, I find women are making the choice to either just continue with surveillance or have prophylactic surgery. We we always discuss chemo prevention with them, but the take up is not as high as I would have thought it might have been for those reasons. Thank you very much, Prof. Tio, for your excellent talk and uh, your uh, answer. So we'd like to welcome the expert herself when it comes to make decisions for risk management, who is no stranger uh, to the surgical fraternity whose work and contributions have expanded the field of breast surgery over the years. Please join us in welcoming Professor Dr. Nur Aishah Muhammad Taib, a director, University Malaya Cancer Research Institute, Senior Consultant of Breast Surgeon, Department of Surgery, University of Malaya. Please welcome, Prof. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, Suniza. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think we are almost at the end of our uh, webinar today. And I think we have to agree we have had such good uh, speakers and uh, have given you through a journey of um, what 
is expected from genetic testing and then risk management. And I guess most of the time, uh, what we face as clinician is uh, as what that question was, how do you handle the helping patients make that decision, right? So the outline of my talk today is looking at the decision itself. And then what is the steps to uh, practicing shared decision making or, or even better collaborative decision making? And then some tips on communicating effectively and how to provide the decisional support. So I'm sure, I mean, uh, we've always used uh, this uh, very, very famous actress Angelina Jolie story because it somehow uh, makes our lives easier in trying to explain to our patients. Um, and you can hear from, I mean, not hear, you can read from her op-ed that she knew the estimation of her risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And she also knew that... Um, not all of those who have the gene mutation will get the cancer. And she, being an unaffected person, was actually happy to carry on and do her uh, prophylactic double mastectomy. So she wanted to be proactive and she wanted to minimize her risk. Okay, and then you wondered, right? Two years later, she decided to do her bilateral uh, salpingo ophrectomy. So I think from the discussions we had today, we are very clear about the fact that it's very difficult to screen for ovarian cancer. Hence, the, the, usually the, um, the discussion with the patient is strongly towards RRBSO and not really towards screening. In fact, in our hospital, we've stopped doing screening. Uh, we've stopped doing CA-153 transvaginal ultrascan, ultrasounds because it does provide some sort of false uh, security among the patients. And, uh, and of course, we have seen some patients even on screening developing like uh, massive ascites within that follow-up before that six-month follow-up. Okay, so I would like to share with both, uh, all of you the work that was uh, being done by our two PhD students, Ms. Grace Yeo and Ms. Hamiza, and this is uh, also Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is a psychologist, researcher in our primary care department. He's an expert in patient decision aids. So together, we have supervised um, Grace and Hamiza to develop the risk management patient decision aids. Um, these are quite important because working in uh, the environment where we are trying to provide not just information, but tools, and uh, coping skills for patients to make that decision, not having something you know uh, that you the patient can go back home with um, becomes quite difficult. So we've run the risk management clinic from 2009. We've been scribbling our little, um, as what Dr. Jamil shared earlier, something like that. But I really lot uh, the creativity from the gynae oncology side to actually uh, make uh, the same copy for every patient, which is really good. Um, but we realize there are a lot of issues in how uh, patients uh, make that decision. So the hence we have uh, tried to develop these two patient decision aids. So the patient decision aid, the first one is for uh, reducing risk of breast cancer. This can also be uh, available to you on the website. You can just Google BRCA, B BRCA DA .um .edu .my. And uh, the second one is on how do I manage risk of developing ovarian cancer. Uh, this is developed by Hamiza, our PhD student, and also my co-supervisor, Dr. Lee. So putting out information um, on the PDA is important. But what is more important is that how people make decisions. And this is actually a science on its own. So I think we have been very uh, fortunate that we have patient, patient decision aid experts in our university and working together with them, we have uh, formed uh, uh, using the Ottawa Decision Support Framework to actually develop the tools. So you can see from what Hamiza has uh, developed, the, the PDA has like five sections and the first section gives some information and then the second section gives the options of reducing their risk. And then the third section is reflecting about what matters most to you, the values of the patient. And section four is what other supports you need to make that decision. And the last one is determining your decision. 
to some key findings that um, uh, Grace found in her study. Her study was actually doing qualitative studies on not just patients, carriers, uh, who are patients as well as unaffected carriers, but there were also a lot of interviews on the clinicians themselves. So we had uh, we knew that most patients did not provide numeric information of age-related risk estimates to women. And I think this is something quite um, expected in our country because at the moment, we don't have actually age-related risk, uh, even from the cancer registry itself. So we are trying to work with our colleagues in uh, NCR to come up with these risk estimates so that it's easier for us when we have more data from the Asian uh, My Braca study we can actually put up this age-related risk much better. Okay, and then the carriers also find that cancer risk is not well understood among the carriers, okay? And of course, the clinicians also have limited understanding of women's values, psychosocial issues that influence their risk management decision-making. I have to apologize. I suddenly hear a lot of uh, noise. It was very quiet until I start to speak. Okay, so I'm, I apologize, it's a little bit noisy, okay? And uh, the BRCA carrier's perspective was that women had differing values uh, and beliefs that influenced their decision-making. And then across all practices, clinicians highlighted that uptakes of risk reducing mastectomy were lowest among the women. So they, they didn't find a lot of women wanting risk reducing mastectomy. And for the patients and the carriers, they thought that it was illogical to do risk reducing mastectomy. It was too drastic and was a redundant decision for them. Okay. And of course, there were a lot of barriers like lack of spousal support. Uh, and they were unwilling to remove something that was healthy. And of course, they had financial constraints. And for the women, they found that risk reducing mastectomy is uh, the perception of it itself was a barrier their fears and concerns, and their lack of a support system. Okay, and Hamiza also found many things, uh, the woman's role in making the decision, the role of the husband, the family, its emotional impact and religious concerns. It was very interesting to see differing uh, interpretation of religious concepts of uh, help seeking in this study. So I think we'll have to watch that space. We have two papers currently under second revision, so hopefully we get that published soon. So let's go to the types of decision making. So I think we all know about paternalistic, that means we are very dogmatic, very directive to the patient, or you can just be providing information, or you can do what we call shared decision making, where it is a two-way process where we are the experts in the medical aspects and the patients are experts in their life and experiences, okay? So when we look at this, we will find that there is the physician's role, the patient's role, the knowledge role, and the objective of the type of decision-making that, that you may choose to do, okay? So we have always seen about shared decision-making, which is something that was developed in, back in, in 1988. So like it's 30 over years old, and I hope a lot of our doctors are actually practicing it. But uh, about 10 years ago, there was another concept of what we call collaborative decision-making where the doctors may actually play a more supportive role in helping people cope with that decision and the patient role is being more proactive in uh, deciding what they want to do, right? Okay, so I'm not going to go into this too much, but just to share with you, the patient themselves are experts in their lives they have values that will affect their decision making. Okay, so I think um, just to share with you, because time is a bit short now, the collaborative decision making helps a lot because the role of the physician is no longer just providing information. They also provide uh, a way to provide optimal action plan to improve the health of the patient. So for example, if the patient had a lot of non-medical issues, they, they are not able to articulate their feelings, their negative uh, feelings that will affect negative coping to making that decision, the physician can bring that to the attention of the patient. So it's not just about providing information about what's good for them, what would reduce their risk, but it's also to identify that they are not able to make those decisions because there are non-medical issues that need to be sorted. So in the end, sometimes the patient may have to be referred on for more counselling to help them come to terms about the feelings, about the 
a decision itself. Okay, so how do we practice shared decision making? So there are people who've already thought about this. So there, are, there is a science behind everything. So there are five steps to doing shared decision making. So the first one is to seek patient or patient's participation. And that's mainly engagement of your patient. Number two is to help your patient explore and compare the treatment options. Number three, assess your patient's values and preference. And the fourth is reach a decision with your patient and e evaluate your patient's decision. So the short form, or I mean, the thing is share, S-H-A-R-E. So, okay, how do we actually engage the patient? So there are a lot of counseling theories and I'm sure all of us have come across this term called therapeutic relationship, where the basic attributes to developing the therapeutic relationship is number one, being congruent. That means you're quite genuine. Okay, and then you have unconditional positive regard. That means you do not uh, put on any opinion on the patient. So you have always unconditionally giving a positive regard to the patient. And you have what we call accurate empathic understanding. That means you can demonstrate the ability to grasp the reality of the patient. Okay, so how do we do this? Again, I think, I mean, I'm a surgeon, you know. When you go through, um, I went through a genetic counseling course, so the, they actually have fantastic tools to help us communicate better to the, with the patients. So the first tool I think I'd like to share with you is the SPIKES. The SPIKES is a six-step protocol for delivering bad news, and this is an application to patients with cancer. So this is published like more than, this is like 20 years ago. Okay, I hope you've actually heard of it. But what it does, it gives you a a quick tip on what to do. So the first step is the setting or setting up where you allow some privacy, make sure you have enough time to, to give patient your attention, right? The second one is perception. Perception is to understand, to help the patient uh, say something before you tell them. So for example, if you're breaking the news that the patient is a BRCA carrier, you should ask them first, what do you think is happening? Why do you, you remember we did that genetic test, what you're expecting to have to, 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 to get from this uh, meeting. So sometimes that is more gentle and sensitive because a lot of patients complain doctors are very brutal at giving the news, right? So if you ask them, the patients already know what they might be expecting. So once they say it themselves, it will gentle the blow a little, right? And the next one is I, I is invitation, is to check first whether they are ready to receive the bad news, okay? And the next one is K, which is knowledge. So it's very important that we use non-technical terms and we should be, you know, giving them small bites of information and don't overwhelm them with too much information, right? The next one is emotions and empathy, okay? So sometimes it's very difficult to you know, to handle uh, patients who are crying and all that, but it's actually an expression of their emotions. So you shouldn't worry too much. You should just hand them, hand them some tissues and knowing that that will actually help the patient express their emotion. And then how do you actually communicate that you are empathetic? Okay. So sometimes it's, it's not easy to recognize people's emotions, but when you're able to accurately um, tell the patient what they are feeling, they will know, they will feel that you completely understand them. Okay, so what is accurate empathy? Accurate empathy is expressing the emotions felt by the patient and normalizing those emotions. Okay, so for example, uh, when you see something, you don't say poor you, right? Because poor you is like uh, you're already judging, you know? For you is like you are not, you know, you're you're judging that person already. So you can say that I can understand how it feels. It must be really hard, or you look anxious. I can understand that you're feeling anxious right now. So those are the way to show the empathy to the patient to show that you are understanding their reality. Okay, so I won't go into much details, but the last one is strategy. Strategy is very important. Because strategy is how you cannot leave the patient hanging, you know, without a strategy to, to move ahead, okay? So what are the next steps? And then when you give this thought 
type of strategies, you must give some form of silver lining. Okay, so what is the silver lining? So if you have someone like a BRCA positive patient, right? Then you can tell them, oh, you know, you can do a lot of things when you know that you have this gene. There are ways to detecting it much earlier by using MRI and so on and so forth. Okay, all right. So what is the next step? Now you're trying to help the patient to explore and compare the treatment options. So really, we are trying to be a bit clear about the evidence uh, that's available to us, how to communicate the risks, and how to recommend the um, what to do next, right? So there are actually a science behind it again. There are actually five steps to it, but the first two steps is exactly what we already talked about. But step three is how we should provide the evidence. So sometimes when we are providing the evidence, it's very difficult for them to understand. So I mean, I will be able to show you through some examples that we have on the decision aids later, how we can communicate the percent, uh, not percentage, the, the absolute risk um, to the patients themselves, okay? And sometimes if it's uncertain, we have to tell them it's uncertain. All right. So how we can present the recommendation uh, and make sure we, we do not use words that can cause biases. Okay. And sometimes it's good to present statistics in both ways. So sometimes you can say 90% chance that it won't help, but you can also say 10% chance it may benefit. Okay. So if you give both, both, ways it makes it a bit clearer and there's not much bias to that because they're always looking at cues from the doctors what the doctor wants them to do okay but you are trying to give them enough information for to make that decision okay and again check for understanding and agreement uh, very important to just check make sure what you have explained to them they understand by asking them to tell you again what what they understand about it all right so cancer risk i think uh sue was great i think she uh, told us all about the risk models and obviously Asian risk models uh, I mean those models that we have already is not fitted to Asians so we're waiting to see the progression of uh, the work the hard work that's happening now uh, from uh, the CRM team right so how do we communicate this to our patients so this is actually an example from the patient decision aid so there is a difference in the risk between someone who is an average Malaysian woman without the genetic change and no other risk factors, and a woman with a BRCA1 and a BRCA2 genetic change. So you can see the pink little people uh, increases. That means the risk of developing cancer is many, many fold higher than that five people in the average risk. Okay, the same thing goes for, this is Hamiza's PDA. So this one is looking at the lifetime risk for uh, ovarian cancer for we, people with no uh, change, no pathogenic change in the genes, and women with the BRCA1 and the BRCA2. So you can see the little teal colored women are definitely higher in the uh, BRCA1 and a bit less in the BRCA2, but definitely many, many fold higher than the average person. Okay, so there are also ways to try to explain because I think a lot of patients have difficulty understanding that screening does not reduce their risk. It just detects the cancer at an earlier stage. So you can see from here that um, you have people who have not gone for screening. Their risk is about 69 to 72 in 100. And if they do screening, their risk is still the same. Okay, And if you compare that to people who do not have the genetic change, it is still very high, okay? But when you do a risk-reducing mastectomy, you can see now that the, the risk has become less. So from someone with a risk of 69 to 72 in 100 over their lifetime, now after risk-reducing mastectomy, the risk is still there. It's not a 100% reduction in risk, but it's lower, it's four in 100. And for the uh, average Malaysian way, it's about 5%. Okay, five in 100. So this clearly shows the risk reduction aspects of the uh, operation compared to just doing screening. Okay, so now we want to assess patient values and preferences. So usually um, this is something like uh, we, we will ask in the PDA, what is important to you? So all these are, uh, are crafted from the qualitative studies that they've done to look at the decisional needs and what is important to the patient. So it is crafted in a way it's interactive so that the patient can answer 
what is important to them. And they actually will come up with the printed uh, thing at the end. Okay. And knowing about stories of other women is important for our patients in Malaysia. What we found that they prefer to hear stories from women rather than look at numbers and evidence. So we, we will put up also stories from women um, to sort of help to engage them further in their decision making. All right, so I think the, I mean, we don't have much time, time is moving on, but uh, you know, patient preference is very important about who makes that decision. Can, do they play a passive role or an active role in their decision making? So I think most times it's individualized to the patient. You need to really engage with the patient to know who plays the major decision making roles, right? So obviously in Asian perspective, we know that family make up a lot of the decision making for the patients, right? So we know that uh, sometimes it's parents, sometimes it's husbands that make that decision for the patient. So involving family, they are close to it. Some people can help them, you know, the family members can help them to remember what's being told to them, right? help them make that decision also to analyze how to do that decision, right? But the cons is that there could be miscommunication, there could be power relationships. We have had women who, even if they have cancer, decide not to have treatments because their mom didn't allow them to have surgery. You know, we've had those sort of things. Okay, and of course, loss of autonomy of the patient and collusion. Collusion is when the uh, person, uh, the person who's supposed to make that decision doesn't know what's happening everything is informed to the family member. So this is quite common in Malaysia, um, but it's fair to say there have been already studies in the Asian settings like in India that shows that when you collude that information to the person who is actually having the problem, it actually worsens their quality of life. So I think what we could do sometimes is to make that aware to the I mean, family members to be aware that actually what they're doing could actually cause harm to their family members. And hopefully with that um, knowledge and also some families uh, or patients may want their families to make the decisions. So in that situation, the family has, the, the patient has clearly given the power of deciding to the son or daughter, then you have to respect the autonomy of that patient that she wants somebody else to make that decision, okay? So cultural competence and so forth. I think we just need to be aware of our own biases and we have to be sensitive to the other cultures. So I think it's a bit difficult in Malaysia. We are quite multicultural and uh, sometimes in hospitals, uh, they're more like non-Malay or not uh, non-Malay or non-Chinese uh, personnel compared to the patient, you know. So we have to be sensitive about different cultures. So for example, if you had uh, someone who is quite religious, they want to use religion as a way of coping, you must understand a bit about, you know, like how Muslim people uh, cope with the disease using religion, for example, okay? So I won't go into details, but we found a lot of this in the transcripts from the qualitative study. They want to have some sort of uh, clear idea what the religion will say about doing risk-reducing uh, strategies like surgery especially, okay? All right, so um, now we are at R, reach a decision with your patient and evaluate your patient's decision. So as I mentioned, uh, there, there's usually a worksheet in the de decision aids that help them clarify their attitudes and help them make that decision. But not all decisions are made during the first visit. Uh, as what uh, Prof. Awan Ng mentioned just now, it usually takes some time before people make decisions for risk-reducing risk mastectomy and risk-reducing salting group fractomy. The same in, for us in our experience. They take a long time. Sometimes they take years before they finally decide to do these uh, surgeries. Okay, so I think uh, I've stated all the five steps to how you should do shared decision making. But remember that uh, collaborative decision making gives you an extra edge in that you are able to see how you can support your patient better. So in order to do that, I think the question just now about what happens when your patient decides not to do whatever you've recommended, right? And as what Prof. Awan Ng said, it is up to the patient. But the first thing that must happen is that the patient must have a clear idea about what uh, the issues are. They must be coping well to make that decision. 
So you know that anyone with, uh, you know, like uh, something they have to decide, like suddenly someone telling them, you know, you have the BRCA gene, you need to, if you want to reduce your risk, this is a way to do it. They will go through the stages of grief because they were losing, they will be losing their breasts, their ovaries, their, their ability to have children, you know, so many issues. So how we as healthcare professionals, we should be able to help make aware to the patient that they will go through this roller coaster ride and how they can actually reach to a state where they probably could make better decisions. Okay, and usually the stage where people make better decisions in when they have reached acceptance. Okay, so besides the Kubler Ross grief uh, stages of grief, we also have the Kubler Ross change curve. So you can see over time, the morale and competence will go up and down, up and down. But you will find that at the point where they can make that decision, where they are learning how to work in that new situation and they feel more positive, that's when they become more competent in making the decisions. So I think we should all practice uh, collaborative uh, decision making. We are almost like a coach, uh, not just a doctor uh, dishing out recommendations, but trying to help them make that decision. And sometimes it's not in our hands. We don't have the expertise to counsel patients sometimes. Maybe they are depressed, they need to see a psycho-oncologist, right? But we need to be aware that our role is not just providing information. Okay, I'm almost at the end of my talk. So if you look at what Angelina Jolie's diary of surgery, one of the excerpts is that it's not easy to make this decision, but it is possible to take control and tackle hit on any health issues. You can seek advice, learn about options, and make choices that are right for you. Knowledge is power. So I think for us, healthcare providers, we need to be able to communicate that knowledge to them because it's a quite a complex issue. Hence, we hope the patient decision aids will be helpful for you. The decision aids can is not used only by the patient themselves. It has to be used by both the healthcare professional and the patients together. Then you will benefit from the PDA. And the last one uh, was what she said was, I wanted to write this to tell other women that the decision to have a mastectomy was not easy, but it is one I am very happy that I made. My chances of developing breast cancer have dropped from 87% to under 5%. So I'm not sure how much our patients can actually verbalize this reduction in risk, but hopefully by providing them images on what that risk is and how much it can be reduced, and you notice that it wasn't a pie chart or a bar chart. It was something concocted by, uh, by Grace herself after she read and talked to the patients, you know, to say that they actually understood more if it, the little, the circle became smaller, okay? Not a pie chart or a bar chart, okay? So she, can, she said that I can tell my children that they don't need to fear they will lose me to breast cancer. So you can know that her value system is strongly on her her family and her children. All right. So I'm almost at the end. Uh, I wanted to share some things, but basically we do have a risk management clinic, but um, I have to say we run it only once a month. Uh, it is a real joint effort by many, many departments. So Gaini Oncology Prof Wu has always supported us. And then all the fellows that go through the Gaini Oncology Services um, postings in UMMC actually get to sit and run this clinic with us. We do a MDT also in the same week of that clinic every month. And we have a wonderful breast radiology support. Uh, we do a MRI breast for our patients. And we also have to find money, charity money to actually pay for these MRIs. Okay, so there is a clinician guide available to all of you. You can actually Google Breast Chapter Academy of Medicine. You can find this document online. It gives you an idea about um, how to what are the factors, what are the criteria for testing. But as uh, Prof. Teo Suhang mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of updates. This is done, I think, more than five years ago. But what is additional to this is essentially um, the, uh, the, the prostatic cancer, the pancreatic cancer uh, history too, okay? So we'd like to acknowledge uh, the funders of these uh, two studies, uh, mainly from the Terry Fox Grant, Cancer Research Malaysia, and then from the Postgraduate Research Grant, as well as the Toyota Foundation Grant. So in conclusion, I've shared with you uh, the science behind decision-making, and there is something that you can work on. So we have the SHARE model, 
to practice shared decision making. And don't forget to add on the collaborative approach. Remember, there are things about how to cope with feelings, deciding together on the next steps, okay? And how we can communicate better uh, using the spikes, uh, using accurate empathy, and we must know how to communicate evidence. And thank goodness, now we have the PDAs to help you do that. So with that, I thank you. Thank you very much uh, for such interesting uh, talk. And uh, I think it's really helpful uh, for us on uh, communicating with patient for breast, uh, if a patient had uh, break to, to break back news. So I think we only have another 10 more minutes to conclude everything because the, by 12.30, we have to uh, end our webinar um, like sharp 12.30. So I think I just uh, get one question. Uh, I summarize it. Uh, patient who has a bilateral risk reduction mastectomy the reduce of the risk will be about 95%. So the another 5% will get uh, breast cancer. So how do you screen this patient and how they normally present if there is a cancer happen to, to them? Okay, I think for uh, the first thing is that the patient already underwent risk reducing mastectomy. So what do we do on the follow-up after these surgeries is mainly clinical examination. We don't routinely do MRIs uh, on, uh, on cleaning this patient because it's not uh, cost effective. And uh, most of the recurrence occur underneath the skin because the, if you remember the Cooper lig ligaments, the, they actually extend right up to the epithelium. So sometimes you can get islands of uh, TDLUs or the breast cells under the skin. So if the patient develops new cancer in the future, they usually develop under the skin and sometimes uh, up in the axilla. So when we do risk-reducing mastectomy, it is not really a science, isn't it? It's an art because sometimes we can't tell, is this breast tissue, is this fat tissue? So we try to do the best we can, but we know that that reduction is not 100%. But still, that reduction is tremendous, isn't it? If you think about it from over like 60, over percent now, it's come down to like almost less about 5% or 4%, less than the average risk in Malaysia anyway. Okay, so um, I think somebody wanted to share the website address, is it? Okay, so for the breast cancer decision aid, it's already online, so you can get it from brcada, so bracada.com. So that, that's something you can easily uh, get from the online. Um, and I suppose, is there another question about, may I know what study was done to prove non-disclosure of diagnosis and proliferation in Asian patients worsen patient quality? Okay, this is an Indian uh, study. It's not a Malaysian study. So um, I don't have the reference with me right now. But yes, please look out for this type of references because I think um, sometimes patients, families, they don't understand the reason why the patient need to know. Because, uh, and, and sometimes the problem is that they worry that their family members is going to have a bad experience when the doctors disclose this uh, results or this news to the, to the family members. So it's important to try and use the spikes so that you provide better experience to your patients so that the families are very comfortable that you will be doing it in a gentle manner. So please look out for that paper. I, I'm sorry, I can't provide it to you right now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Aisha, for such a lovely and interesting uh, talk just now. So thank you very much for all uh, the speakers with the great and outstanding discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, here we are at the end of our webinar. We hope that it was most insightful and interesting. So we would like to thank uh, our panel of speakers for being part of our webinar, sharing their knowledge in their respective fields of expertise with regards to BRCA genetic testing and risk management. Our webinar would not have been success without the presence of all of you. We thank you for your valuable contribution and active participation throughout the webinar. Kindly note to all participants that the certificate of attendance will be emailed out later after you had completed the webinar evaluation. We would like also to thank all secretariat and our Faculty of Medicine Visibility team for their dedication and hard work in ensuring that our webinar is a success. For your information, we will be convinced in the afternoon at 2 p.m. Uh, for the public forum uh, with the topic of 
making smart decision on genetic testing. So once again, thank you and have a wonderful weekend.